Well, pull up a chair and set a spell here at Tales from SYL Ranch Live, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. And tonight on Tales from SYL Ranch, we have the Fandime Master's 40th anniversary review of Superman. Hey, Larry, Larry, how are you doing today? Chris Reeve is a Superman. Yes, I'm going to make a big point about that. Chris Reeve is Superman. So to explain my show, for the benefit of people who don't come in right at the top of the hour like Larry, Dar Larry did, I do live reviews. Sometimes I do serious films and TV, sometimes I do schlock, and sometimes I do something with a modern appeal, like next month I'll be starting to do The Orville when it comes back. Usually, however, I stick to a period from about 1900 to 1980, and that's because the period after 1980 is pretty well documented because of all the great science fiction we got and all the fandom that came after it, and all the of the great technology that allowed us to document it. But there is, from the period from 1900 to 1980, quite a lot of science fiction and a lot of science fiction fandom that isn't well documented. And so part of the reason I do the show is to document it. I will take any and all questions, comments, and nasty remarks. You can tell me if I miss something, if I'm completely full of crap, or if I happen to be an amazingly hoopy frood, which is probably more likely. I also go into more depth than most reviewers. I don't just say if I liked a film or not. I go into acting, directing, cinematography, and the mechanics of making a film. And I can do this because a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor. And so I can speak with some authority. Not as much as a modern working actor. Never want to give that impression. But with some authority. As they often say, those who can do and those who can't teach. And I think my reviews are probably a lot like teaching. Now I'm going to give you a warning. This one is going to be long. And that's because this film really means a lot to me personally. And to be honest, I'm going to go into, as most do, movies do, you know, this is one of the weird things. This film really is one of the most important movies I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to talk about a lot of personal things, and I'm going to put several of them that I'm pulling out as clips. And by the same token, I think that in doing this, this may be the best review that I have yet given, and probably may be one of the ones that sticks with me as one of the best ever. I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. Uh, it's not just giving a glowing review, which I will give a glowing review to this film, but this is also going to be a true Fandai Masters review, so you will learn a lot from going into this. So as a non-spoiler review for this movie, I can say that this is the best Superman movie ever made, and is probably going to be the best Superman movie that will ever be made. It's also one of the best, if not the best, superhero uh, origin stories and movies ever made. And at its heart, at its real heart, it is a love story. And it's a love story that's one of the few that I can sit through. Take me to a rom-com and I will fall asleep. But it has enough action and character development for everyone that carries a good 2.5 hours in the director's edition. And to be clear, I am reviewing the director's edition because that is the movie that Richard Donner wanted to make had he not had producer and studio interference, which he had a lot of. Um, it's not very different from the theatrical cut. There are really just two or three scenes that are thrown in. Uh, but uh, that is the one I'm reviewing, the director's edition, which is 2.5 hours long with all of those cool titles in it. This is my second or third favorite film, generally speaking. My, they, it, my favorite film of all time, right up here at the top, is Star Wars, the first one. My second and third are vacillating all the time, whether or not it's Superman or Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. They have tended over my life to just kind of sit there, you know. Uh, sometimes Superman pops up, sometimes Star Trek II pops up. But in having watched this this week repeatedly, because this is one of those movies, it's like Star Wars. If you take Star Wars and you throw Star Wars at me, almost any time, 24-7, 365, I will watch Star Wars. And the same thing is true with Superman. If you take that and throw it at me, 24-7, 365, I will probably watch it. And in having done so so many times, it is now edged out over... 
um, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and frankly nudging up toward number one. There may come a time, depending on how things go, where Superman and uh, Star Wars actually compete for being number one. Larry Larry says, Superman the movie and Superman 2 were one movie. Yes, the original story went uh, way long, so they released it in two parts. Yeah, I'm going to get into that when I get into the production aspects of it and kind of what happened behind the scenes to make that happen. But this film is one in which there were a lot of creative, experienced people who were in front of the camera, and there was perfect, brilliant casting all the way around. Everyone is perfectly well cast. And it does hold up well, even some of the special effects. Although you do, as always, have to excuse some of those effects. They were working with models, not CGI. And the fact that this film clearly takes place in the late 1970s. So technology and sociology will always date. Always. They will always date. When you come back to me in 40 years, and I'll still be redoing reviews then, um, Everything that we think of as cool today is going to look fake and hokey, and your grandchildren are going to laugh about it. However, the question you need to ask yourself with this movie is fairly simple. Could you make this movie today by making changes in technology and updating the era? Would this film still work without making any other changes to the script? And the answer on this film is yes, a very resounding yes. This would work today if you remade it with no changes in the script aside from updating technology and the era so that it's in the modern era. And the reason for this is that it was brilliantly written. It is written in four very distinct acts where different things happen. And it is one of the few superhero origin stories that actually um, all of these acts flow together. You know, it's not like, I don't know, uh, Captain America, uh, the first Avengers. Uh, uh, Captain America, you know, you have the origin story and then it kind of disconnects from the rest of the film. In this case, it all completely flows together. One act influences the next, which influences the next, and influences the next. It is perfectly well done. And in fact, it is so good that Brian Singer actually tried to make a sequel with Superman Returns. He failed pretty miserably uh, because his script was just so massively flawed. But he did try. He could see this was a damn good movie. It was never going to be made again, never going to be as good again, and so he tried. And Larry Larry says it opens with a salute to cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth. Yes, Jeffrey Unsworth uh, died not long after the film was done shooting. And he was quite a legend in Hollywood by then. And I, again, it's something I'm going to talk about when I get into this cinematography. So as an introduction, as I always say, you cannot neither watch nor review a film this age from a 2018 perspective. As most of the movies that I review that are older, you have to approach it as a viewer of that time. And a lot has changed in 40 years. And if you don't know this historical context, you really can't judge it. But that's not why it's going to go long. Because I have a problem, which is I... If I set the context for both fandom and for the era of the time, it becomes extremely repetitive over time. And I say the same things over and over, and I try to figure out new ways to say the same damn thing. So I'm not going to do that. The solution that I decided to come up with, I wasn't entirely happy with. But I do these movies, tend to do them on anniversaries. And so, like, next year, I'll be doing a lot of, you know, uh, 1919, 1929, 1939. So what I'll do is I will set the stage one time for any given year that I'm doing it so that I don't have to repeat it over and over and over and over throughout the year. And I have already gone through a lot of stuff about 1978 life and fandom. And so, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say to you, please do the additional reading. Um, go out and take a look at those. I have the links to them below for both uh, Life in 1978 and uh, Fandom in 1978. And if you look at my channel pretty closely, I also have a couple of very prominent play playlists that are about Life of the Era and Fandom of the Era that you can look through and kind of see what things were like in various eras if you want to. And I certainly urge you to visit those links 
because I think you get a very good idea of the context. It's very informative. So on with the rest of this review. As I said, for me personally, this is a very important film. And here's one that I'm going to pull out as a clip. Modern writers can't write Superman. I have been a Superman fan since as long as I can remember. When I was young, I used to collect Superman comics and almost anything having to do with him. I have, in fact, at my mother's house in her attic, boxes upon boxes upon boxes of uh, comic books that I collected over that time period. I kind of came in at the middle tail end of the Silver Age. Now, I got really, really lucky because my grandparents, well, they had five children, four of whom were boys, and they collected late Golden Age and early Silver Age comics. So at my grandparents' ranch, in one of the buildings they used for storage, were tons and tons and tons of these Golden Age and Silver Age comics. So I got to read those comics. Incredibly lucky. Um, sadly, I think they're all gone now, which is too bad. I think today they might even be worth something. But as someone who was a fan, boy oh boy, was it really awesome to be able to read those comics uh, as they were originally put out. Um, just amazing. And Superman and Clark Kent are characters with whom I can personally identify. I probably have, I know I have, a much better handle on these characters than modern writers in either film or comics. Because to some extent, not completely, not Superman, but to some extent, his life actually parallels mine. Which is why I get so damned angry when modern writers just continuously blow this character now, how Superman's life sort of mirrors mine. I was born in a very small town in South Dakota. I grew up in a city, mid where I am now, midtown Lincoln, Nebraska, which at the time was a small city of about 100,000. It's about 250,000 now with a metro area, Omaha, Nebraska. That is about 1 million people that's half an hour away, so it's grown quite a lot in my lifetime. But I did spend anywhere from two weeks to a month until I was 15 out at my grandparents' very rural working cattle ranch. This is extremely rural South Dakota. And in fact, there's one, you know, the whole thing looks amazingly like the Kent farm. It really does. Um, and it's very isolated. I've talked about this before, but it's worth mentioning because I'm pulling this out as a clip, and I hope maybe one of the writers on Superman will watch me. This is extremely rural, South Dakota. So rural that most people probably don't believe that it would exist in modern times. In the piece of family ranch land that's still in the family, it is two miles from the cabin that's out there to the nearest gravel road. And those two miles are ruts that have been made over many, many years by uh, pickup trucks going out to check cattle. They're ruts, that's all they are. When the grass grows around them, if nobody has been through those uh, things to get through it. It's interesting because you can't see the ruts. You just put the car in the ruts and you kind of let the car go following the ruts. <laughs> After you get to the gravel road, it is then another 40 or so miles to the nearest paved road. And after that, that paved road is about 10 miles to the nearest town of Wall, South Dakota. Nobody does snow removal on those gravel roads, and certainly not on those ruts. Right now, out there, they probably have a fair amount of snow. This would be the time of year they'd be getting snow. And the way that they work out there is they go into town, they get about six months' worth of, worth of provisions, and then they drive back before the snow hits because there is every likelihood that they will be completely snowed in for three to six months, depending on the weather. That is how rural that really is, and it still goes on today. Now, the other thing is, in addition to that, I spent 10 years in Chicago, which is close enough to Metropolis as to be no difference whatsoever. And of course, growing up, I was a geek. Hell, I'm still a geek. 
I'm a geek, and particularly as a child, I identified with Clark Kent's geekiness and, of course, wished that I could just take off my glasses and become Superman as he did. And to be honest, I still entirely identify with this character, and sometimes I wish I could just take off my glasses and become Superman. Because, damn it, particularly after this film, I want to fly. Now, modern writers don't get Superman right because they cannot understand his backstory. They, do, they are mostly urbanites who have never lived in the places that I have described. And rural life requires an enormous amount of self-reliance. And that's simply not present in cities. Now, for example, when I was out there, when I got to, a, when I was young, five or so, I was involved in a uh, cattle roundup. Now, in those things, you have pickup trucks out there, and you also get to be put on horses because sometimes the cattle will drift off and they'll go into places where a pickup truck just can't go. I spent eight hours on a horse. I spent eight hours on a horse. My grandmother likes to like to talk about it when she was alive. What I remember was the moment we got to the uh, pasture seven miles away where we were putting these cattle, I went down to the river, the Cheyenne River, which is nearby, and I got off my horse, Babe, my father's horse, and I waded into the water because I was, my legs were bowed from sitting on that horse for eight hours. And the funny thing was, Babe wandered in to the, just walked in with me, got a little deeper, but had the same problem, you know, where, the, where I'd been sitting on her. Because in my family, you didn't get to ride with a uh, saddle until such time as you could ride bareback. So I rode that whole thing bareback. So she was pretty hot and sweaty herself and just wandered into the, into the uh, river with me. But in addition to that, you know, anybody who's beyond a certain age, you help out with the chores. Um, a working ranch like that is a family business. You know, everybody helps out. And so a lot of times I would be with my grandfather when we went to check cattle, usually did that twice a day by pickup. And we would also do things like walk fences because fences can break or cattle can try to push against them to get through. And so you'd have to walk along, usually in an incredibly hot summer day, and if the fence was down someplace, pounded in new posts, repaired all of the barbed wire, and, you know, that would take time. And sometimes you'd have what we used to call a crawly cow, and that's a cow that didn't care about the barbed wire. And so the cow would just, you know, squeeze itself through, usually into some neighbor's pasture. Well, you got to get your cow out of there, because every blade of grass on a working ranch is important. And so you don't let your cattle graze excuse me, in somebody else's land for very long. You get them out as soon as you possibly can. So we had to do stuff like that as well. Now, fun thing about that was um, I, uh, my grandfather taught me to drive at the age of 12 because that's not unusual out there. And it's not illegal either. Um, out there, you're helping out with chores. So the soon as you can get to the point where you can drive vehicles and or heavy equipment, you get to do it. And so there was a lot of that. Even when I was really young, um, I helped out around the house with my grandmother, you know, pulling weeds. I certainly remember pulling a lot of weeds and just generally, you know, doing that sort of work around um, in between when I was reading comics, reading a lot of comics. Larry, Larry says, the Kent Farm was filmed in Canada. Yeah, there's a scene in there when they're uh, at Jonathan Kent's funeral. And they pull up, and it's a view of a valley. And to me, it is extraordinary because it is just like, you look down in that valley, and I go, my God, that is just exactly like the valley where my grandparents' ranch was. It was in a valley, and it was just amazing. But you have to have a lot of self-reliance, and I'll give you an example of this. When my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago, we had an extended... Now, we have a, a family uh, cemetery out there. Plot for me. That's where I'm going to end up. And in order to bury my grandfather, a, a extended relative, I think like a second cousin or something, who had a backhoe, came over, and he dug the grave with the backhoe. And then myself and a cousin and my uh, uh, living uncles, we lowered that casket 
into the ground by ourselves. And then our cousin covered it over. And the reason that happened was it's way out in rural South Dakota. If you don't do it, it don't get done. That is how it has to work. If That's how everything works. If you don't do it, it don't get done. So that is the sort of thing you have to have. However, while self-reliance is definitely key to surviving, and I mean surviving out there, sometimes you need help. And you give help to your neighbors, and you receive help from your neighbors. And you do this for practical reasons. Just in terms of being nice, you do it for that. But also for very practical reasons. If you don't give help, you don't get help. And you might go bankrupt, or in some cases, you can die out there. And this is why. Um, hi, Captain Jesse. Glad to see you tonight. Uh, hope you'll enjoy this review. This is why, for example, in this film, when Superman sets down the helicopter, he's caught it, and he puts it down on top of the Daily Planet building, he doesn't immediately fly the injured pilot to the hospital. Instead, he calls to the two guys who've been running basically ground control on top of the planet who are just basically standing there slack-jawed at what they've just seen, and he says to them, gentlemen, this man needs help because he expects them to do good deeds the way that he was raised to do them. He expects that others will take over and do the good deeds that they can do after he's already done the fantastic things that they can't. Now, modern writers also detest what is traditionally called the American way. And the American way isn't what they think. And it's not what a lot of people now think. And it's not old-fashioned. It is not bad. And it is not camp. It sounds like ultra-patriotism, but that's not really what it is. The American way, as basically defined until 10 or 15 years into my lifetime, was a small, limited government that interferes with freedom, not at all. That is what has traditionally set America, the United States, apart from every single other nation on earth. Other nations have constitutions that say what the citizens can do. Here in the United States, we have a constitution that says what the government can and can't do and is supposed to have extraordinarily limited powers. Now, that's not the case today, sadly. Sadly, today we have a giant federal government that controls almost every aspect of your life. But the American way, traditionally, is simply a small government that does not interfere with freedom. And if anything, it is there to protect freedoms. Modern writers are socialists and communists who detest the notion of a limited government. And so when Superman very, very um, plainly and straightforwardly plays it totally straight in this film, that's the right way to do it, when he says he fights for truth, justice, and the American way, it's not old-fashioned. It's not bad. It's not camp. This is a man who is fighting for what the United States has traditionally been as part of the American way, limited government that does not interfere with citizens' uh, rights. Now, if you were writing Superman correctly today with all of everything that goes on, this huge government that controls your life, all of the spying that we have going on, in all the cameras everywhere, I truly believe that if you were writing him today correctly, Superman would be a libertarian and not a conservative, you might think. He is definitely a big believer in law and order, but the kind of law and order he has always supported isn't the same law and order as we have today. In his world, in his worldview, his hope is that the people in charge of law and order are good people, where a law enforcement is presumed to be the good guys. And uh, so when he takes people over to them and done bad things, he expects that system to work. Sadly, in many places in the United States, we have too much corruption for that to work. And I, that's why I think if Superman was being written correctly today, he would be a libertarian who would object to that sort of thing. He fights for truth, justice, and the American way. And if the justice part doesn't work, he's going to fight for it. If the American way part doesn't work, he's going to fight for it. And same with truth. 
Fighting for truth, justice, and the American way is not a bad thing. It's not old-fashioned. It is not camp. It is truly serious. And that is why Christopher Reeve plays it as seriously as he does. It just comes out. Lois Lane says, what are you here for? And he says, I'm here to fight for truth, justice, and the American way. And he's just totally straightforward about it. It's a great way to deliver that line. Larry Larry says, George Reeves' Superman uh, series opened with every episode with truth, justice, and the American way. And that was at a time when people understood what the American way was. That it was what set us apart from every single other nation on earth. Limited government that is there, if anything, to protect freedoms of people. So you guys at DC or at Warner Brothers who are making these movies... Call me. You need to. Right now, call me. Because I will deliver scripts for you that work for this character. You will otherwise just continue to see his popularity wane, as it has been doing it over time. You are blowing it big time, because you do not understand this character. You don't understand how that rural living actually impacts him. And you don't understand the traditional concept of the American way. Call me. Call me right now. You need to. Okay, so a few things about me personally on this one. Let me get a uh, cough out of the way. A few things personally about this for me. Um, Where and when I first saw this film. Well, we can do this a little bit like Jack Webb from Dragnet. It was Friday, December 15th, 1978. It was cold in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was 13 years old, about a month away from my 14th birthday. I was with my family, but my name's Bill Stone. I was a Fandai Padawan. Now, everyone in in fandom had been very, very stoked for this movie for a couple of years. Now, I saw this movie for the first time at the Cooper Theater here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Now, this is one of our now vanished um, single screen theaters, and it seated 100, I'm sorry, 810 people. It's a very large theater. The screen was gigantic by today's standards. I saw 2001 Space Odyssey there on a re release. And while this was not a cinemascope theater, it gave me a very immersive feel because of where I sat. Because the year before was Star Wars. I had had some incredibly good bad luck. I got to, I got to a CinemaScope screen, an actual scope screen, and I got there and it was so crowded that I had no choice but to sit dead center, front row. Now in that large theater, because it seated over a thousand, the screen was far away, enough away from row one that sitting there you didn't get a parallax distortion. It's not like today where if you sit in a row one, my God, you're going to be staring up and it's going to look terrible. But back then, it was far enough away, and the screen was so large that it filled my field of view completely, from top to bottom. If I just looked, I was seeing it. And it was a curved screen, because that was CinemaScope. CinemaScope had a curved screen. So not only was this thing very large, but the curvature of the screen, because of where I was sitting, completely filled my field of view, from periphery to periphery. And that, seeing Star Wars... It was an amazing experience that I will never forget. And that's why I started doing this with some movies afterward. And I would keep doing it until, you know, these small screens like we have now in cineplexes that don't seat that many people and you have bad parallax distortion. Uh, nowadays, I try to sit in the center of the uh, seat of the, of the theater. But I saw Superman by sitting center seat front row. In fact, I was with my family, and I said, well, I'm going to go down and sit center seat front row. And they said, I'm not going to do that. And I said, well, I'll be by myself then. And I did. I went and sat center seat front row, and it was great. I later saw Star Trek The Motion Picture a year later in a similar theater, the State Theater, which is still in existence. It's not very well maintained, but it is still in existence. And then I saw Star Trek II at the State again, uh, the State again, and then I, same place, dead center front row, that time with a few of my friends, Star Trek fans from our local Star Trek fan club, Starbase Andromeda, which still meets today. And then I saw Star Trek III again at the Cooper 
And that one was really interesting because uh, I was sitting next to a girl that had been standing in line for me the whole time. We were sitting dead center front row. And when the Enterprise exploded, she just grabbed my hand. It was such a powerful moment that, you know, it was just like, hold my hand. And it was, it was really interesting. So Superman. I'm sitting down there, front row, dead center. Not a CinemaScope screen, so it isn't completely covering my field of view, but it was still freaking awesome. If you want to see it the way that I did, I did semi-recreate this fairly successfully by putting a Blu-ray copy of it on my 40-inch monitor in front of me here, you know, completely filling the screen. I stuck my chair up as close as I possibly could so that I could be right there in front of it. And then I cranked the volume. First on VLC Media Player, I cranked it to 200%, and then the computer volume itself to about 150%. And that sort of was what, like, you would hear. It wasn't really, because in a big theater like that, you had, you know, speakers all over. And some of the speakers might be doing individual audio tracks that you don't hear with just two speakers now. And the bass would vibrate the walls of those theaters. And... What you miss doing it now, and it's unfortunate, is you miss the 809 other people who are feeling the same things you are. Because this is such a well-done movie that you, they are feeling the same things you are. When things are happening that are exciting, they cheer. When things are happening that are bad, they cry. And when things happen that are funny, they laugh. And when I saw this, everybody was just plain blown away. And that was largely because, for the first time, we really did believe a man can fly. It was a promise made on all the advertising, and they were right. And that can't be underestimated. See, it's nothing by today's standards with CGI. We can certainly believe a man can fly. But back in 1978, no one had really done Superman flying, and everybody really bought it. Certainly Superman had flown in cartoons, he had flown in movie serials, he had flown in the 1950s George Reeves serial, but uh, TV show, but it wasn't the same. You, you knew that, you know, it was just marrying special effects, and it wasn't that great. It was good for its time, but no one really believed that George Reeves was flying. This one delivered. For the first time, we really did believe a man can fly. And I don't want to underestimate to the audience experience of that era. You cannot, you, it's impossible to recreate now. Audiences who go to movies, it's totally impossible to recreate. It's not the same at all. When you've got 809 other people sitting next to you who are feeling the same things, and they're feeling excited when some exciting thing is going on, and they're cheering, and it is totally infectious. The only thing that I can liken it to is if you go to a live performance of like a rock musician or something. It's an infectious thing. When everybody is feeling the same thing, when everybody's crying, and, and everybody feels the same way, it is a shared experience that you simply don't get with modern movies. It's not even with Star Wars movies. Sure, you have some people that are cheering, but it's not like having 810 people all feeling the same thing and all reacting the same way. And it just feeds off of each other and feeds off of each other and feeds off of each other. It becomes an amazing experience. So I'm also going to talk about the science because it's kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. Uh, Gavin just says, the new Grinch movie, I laughed so hard, the lost breath, and could, uh, uh, I could have laughed any harder, I would have uh, totally missed my diaper. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that movie, so I can't tell you. Um, but, uh, you know, you always hope for something funny if you go to a, you know, something like that that's supposed to be funny. I've been to so many movies lately in the last 20 years that just make you feel dead inside. You have no reaction to them whatsoever. But not with this movie. Everybody who went to it, all 810 of those people, and repeatedly because I went to that movie repeatedly with large audiences like that it always had large audiences when I went to it all feeling the same thing at the same time you know people are crying you're missed people are misting up and it's just amazing it is a, it is a shared experience that you cannot get today with movies but the, the the science behind this there's some science there's a guy a uh, physicist named Dr. James Kakaklios. And he has done a book called The Physics 
of superheroes. Now, I'd link to it below, but apparently if I do that too much, I may get community guideline strikes, so I don't want to do that. What I have linked to, however, is one of his lectures that he gave on this subject, which is part of the Distinctive Voices lecture series, and you have it's a link to it down below at the very bottom of my um, uh, uh, my uh, uh, description. Go watch that. It's utterly fascinating. Now, I take my cues with Superman, even with Superman, from Dr. Kakaklios, and I was lucky enough to see him do one of his lectures very similar to this one in person at a Star Trek convention, and I approached him afterwards because uh, Larry Larry sing the opening was perfect. Oh, God, am I going to talk about that opening in terms of great moments? Yes, a perfect opening, absolutely. There is so much in this film that's perfect. Captain Jazz asks, why do modern movie theaters barely hold 75 to 100 people per screen? Um, so they can have lots and lots of these uh, you know, theaters inside of a cineplex, get as many people in for any particular movie, and it's uh, to some extent to cover what happens if a movie sucks. You know, if they've got two screens running a movie that sucks, and they have six other screens that are running movies that are any good, uh, that means that they can take the loss a little better. I think that's basically the reason for it. It just went out of style. It just went out of style, unfortunately. But what Dr. Kakaklios does is he approaches any given superhero, and he says, okay, we will give this superhero a one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature. We don't say, oh, it's not possible for people to run super fast. We say, okay, if it's possible for someone like the Flash or Quicksilver to run at super speeds and see things at a slow-down rate, does the things that they do make sense in terms of physics. And so he gives a talk about this and gives some examples of where it does work and where it doesn't. But that's what we ask ourselves. What is the one-time miracle exemption that we can give to these people that is miracle exemption from the laws of nature? So I talked to Dr. Kakaklios. I said, what do you do with Superman? You know, he's got so many powers. How do you have a one-time miracle exemption for Superman? And he pointed me off to some physicists who actually, not him, but have considered this whole problem and even wrote a paper on it. I couldn't find it, so I can't find, put, get a link to it, but I read the paper. And their conclusion is very simple. Superman does, in fact, only have one superpower. His superpower is that he can control inertia. And all of his powers can be explained with that one miracle exemption from laws of nature. So, for example, super, super strength. Well, if you can control inertia, it doesn't fracking matter anymore. <laughs> if you can control inertia, it just doesn't matter. And getting into other powers, if you have, um, if you, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting back to my notes. Um, if you have supervision, right, that's, that works too. Heat vision, well, you're talking about controlling the inertia and, uh, you know, atoms in between your eye and the target and the inertia in the target so that they are bumping into each other and creating heat. X-ray vision also works. It's not really X-rays. If you think about it, what he's probably actually doing is using his, in using his powers to, on a target, move the atoms just slightly apart enough with inertia so that he can see through them. Not enough to hurt anybody or hurt any object that he's looking through, but just enough to be able to see through them. He can probably also do this with lead. He has a notorious weakness of not being able to see through lead, but because that lead is really dense. But if you sat there and you're trying really hard to move the atoms apart, what happens with lead, because it's so dense, is it probably loses its cohesion. It starts to fall apart, or maybe has explosive results in terms of how it does that. Superman probably can do things with lead, but it won't work out the way his X-ray vision would work out. His flight, well, if he can control inertia, his flight is not a problem. His speed is not a problem. No speed is a problem, including faster than light travel. And therefore, by the way, a reversal of time. What we're seeing at the end of the movie, everybody thinks he's turning back the world. He's not. What Superman is doing is flying at faster than the speed of light, which for him is a reversal of time. And when he's done, he flies back again so that he can get beneath the speed of light and then go down and take care of things. Now the filmmakers didn't have that in mind. But if you think about Superman as an ability, his one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature is that he can control inertia. 
Makes perfect sense. And it also explains things like when he can stand in one place and say, be hit by the Batmobile. Well, ordinarily, people would, there's, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, so he should be flying off in the other direction. But if you can control inertia, it doesn't matter. The Batmobile can bounce off, and you will stay in one place. Um, this is also invulnerability. If you can control inertia, any weapon that's used against you doesn't matter. There's no inertia. You shoot bullets at some guy, no inertia when it hits him. Just nothing. So no velocity. That's how you get the invulnerability. He probably also has quite a lot of other powers that has never even occurred to him to try because they're so fantastic. I mean, you know, if you can control inertia, that opens up an enormous, enormous, almost limitless door. Now, there is another piece, couple of pieces I'm, uh, of science I'm going to talk about. One of them is Superman catching Lois Lane uh, from that fall in the building. There has been a massive, massive uh, ongoing conversation in fandom about how Su Lois Lane stays alive. In real physics, if Superman just ran up there and caught her, well, she's coming down from that building at a fairly high velocity by the time he hits her, she would get killed on the impact of hitting his arms. But if he can control inertia, it doesn't matter. And the same thing, too, if he's like doing super strength feats with large objects, if he picks up like a boat, like apparently he did in this film and dropped it off in front of the jail, ordinarily, almost any place that you would pick up a boat, it, you know, if you picked it up from the front, you'd probably tear the front off. If you put, picked it up from the middle, well, you have all of this mass that's going to be crashing around you and it's going to start falling apart. But if Superman can control inertia, doesn't matter. He can pick up anything he wants, anywhere he wants, and it will not matter. Larry Larry says, initially he could only leap tall buildings. Yes, what happened was in uh, the Max Fleischer cartoons, and I will talk about this uh, in terms of some of what goes on towards the end of the review. Oh my God, I'm at 45 minutes. Oh my God, this is going to run so long. I have never gotten through an entire um, uh, run through on this. This could be four hours. It really could. Um, but yes, he used to only leak tall buildings. What, happens in the Max, what happened was in the Max Fleischer cartoons, they found that it didn't look very good. And there is one cartoon where Superman's just leaping. And they said to DC, hey, can we just make him fly? It'll look a lot better. And DC said, yeah, go ahead. And then DC picked up flying out of the Max, uh, Max Fleischer cartoons. Happens a lot. And it happened with this movie too, where the comics pick something up from the movies. So, But even disregarding that, in terms of Superman uh, having the ability to control inertia. If you watch closely, Superman doesn't just stop and catch Lois Lane. Watch the building in the background because it's showing her falling as Superman catches her. Then the background slows down and starts going back up. Clearly what Superman has done is the correct thing physically. He has matched her velocity and then slowed her down and brought her back up. And he does the same thing with the helicopter. Matches. You can see it as the moving buildings moving by. He matches velocity with the helicopter, takes in his hand, and then starts back up. So that, my friends, clears up that entire scientific um, debate that has gone on in fandom since this movie was released. Now, there is one bit of science that cannot happen. And that is California falling to the ocean after the big one. That's not possible because what's actually happening there is the two um, tectonic plates are both moving north but at different speeds. And they are locked up at several points like the San Andreas area. They're locked up like this. And every once in a while as one of them starts to move north at a different speed, you get, you know, pull on where it's locked up and you get earthquakes. Someday, I don't know when, could be tomorrow, could be 100 years ago, from now, could be 1,000. But someday, the pressure on this is going to be so bad that it pulls. That's the big one. And when that happens, it will kill millions of people. All of those supposedly earthquake-proof buildings are not going to be earthquake-proof. The West Coast is going to be a death zone. It is going to happen. It will happen someday. 
maybe not any time in my lifetime, but it will because tectonic plates will not stand that pressure forever and they will go snap at some point and that will be a disaster of biblical proportions. Yes, what no Luther land. Yes, none of the stuff that Lex wants to do. That could never happen. But aside from that, we just leave the science alone. So with all that said, I guess I'll issue myself a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a Fandai master. And that means the fandom is strong with me. And that means nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about a half an hour early. This is not a boast or a brag. This is unfortunately where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to about a hundred years' worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the entire century that came before, and you find out there isn't much that's new in the world. And sometimes it interferes with your ability to enjoy things. I don't think. It, w it has never interfered with my ability to enjoy Superman. Knowing everything about the movie since I have, since 1978, has never interfered with my ability to enjoy it because it is such a well-put-together film. So the plot. Well, to begin with, are you fracking kidding me? I mean, really? Have you been living under a rock in a very, very deep cave for the last 80 years? Because... Superman debuted in June of 1938, 80 years ago. His basic backstory is famous worldwide, and that is why if you're going to do a Superman movie today, don't bother doing the origin story. Just start out. Everybody knows where he comes from. He's probably the most iconic superhero ever, with Batman probably a very close second behind him. Superman was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. Uh, it first appeared, as I said, in Action Comics number 1. It's where Superman still makes his home today in Action Comics. Siegel was the writer and Schuster was the artist. And they got completely screwed. DC made a fortune on this. But legally, DC owns the character of Superman. That character went on to be part of an empire that made billions of dollars over the years and still does. And Siegel and Schuster got screwed. And I'm going to explain exactly how he got screwed. They got screwed. United States copyright and patent laws are a travesty. Now, in terms of Joe Schuster, the uh, artist on the original Superman, he was working uh, at various places, and in 1946, both Siegel and Schuster sued DC to have their contracts annulled, and then they would reclaim their rights to Superman. But the following year, the New York Supreme Court ruled that the publisher had validly purchased the rights to Superman when it bought the very first story in uh, 1938. And they, the Supreme Court said, and I quote, they had transferred to Detective Comics, Inc. all of the rights in the, the comic strip Superman, including the names, the title, the characters, and the conception. And after that, um, DC removed the created by byline that had been on all Superman stories since they first started. Uh, Larry Levy says they had to fight hard to get their names in the movies. Yeah, I'm going to come up right now on that. There was another, um, there was another uh, attempt, and I'll talk about that when I get to Siegel, to try to get the rights back, but nothing ever happened of it. Now, in the late 1960s, sadly, Schuster, who was an artist, his eyesight began to go, and in order to make a living, at one point, he was a delivery man. Now, Jerry Robinson, who was a writer, and, or uh, I think an artist at D.C., he was uh, the uh, president uh, a few years later of the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists. He claims that Schuster had to come to D.C. to deliver a package. And uh, naturally, anyone who worked there was completely embarrassed. And he was summoned up to the CEO's office. He was given $100.00 and told to find a new coat and get a new job. And by 1976, Schuster was almost blind, and he was living in a California nursing home. But in 1975, because they knew this movie was coming out in a couple of years, Jerry Siegel launched a publicity campaign that Schuster participated in, and it protested DC Comics' treatment 
of Siegel and Schuster. So the Association of American Editorial Cartoonists, whose president at that time was the aforementioned Jerry Robinson, got involved in this campaign along with then-current and very, very hot comic book artist Neil Adams. And there was a lot of negative publicity and uh, over their handling, of DC's handling of the whole affair. And so, and they had this upcoming movie. They didn't want that to get in the way of the movie. So the parent company, Warner Communications, reinstated the created by a credit that had been dropped 30 years before. And then they granted the pair a lifetime pension of $20,000 a year. If you were to translate that into modern dollars, that would be $79,000. However, be aware, their pensions were never adjusted for inflation. This was later increased to a $30,000 pension, which in today's money would have been about one hundred twenty k. Almost pittances, really, almost pittances. Even at the time, 20 to 30K was not a ton of money. And today, somewhere between 79 and 120K. Could you live on that? Yeah, you could live on that in my market, but you can't live on that in the coasts. And it was the same with the 20 to 30,000 they got as a fracking pittance. They also got health benefits, but they got this in exchange for agreeing to never again challenge ownership of Superman. And again, remember, these stipends were never adjusted for inflation. Now, Schuster, he did have this stipend coming in, and he still fell into debt by the time of his death. It was around $20,000, and he died in 1992 of heart failure. At which time, this 30000 stipend, if you translated it into $1992, would have been worth about 66000 had it been adjusted for inflation, which it never was. It was never adjusted for inflation. After he died, because he was in debt, DC Comics agreed. Oh, thank you, Massa. DC Comics agreed to pay off his unpaid debts in exchange for an agreement with his heirs to never challenge the ownership of Superman. DC, you guys are scumbags. Then we have Jerry Siegel. Now, he went on to do a number of other things. He was a writer. He went to other companies. He, he did some work at Marvel. Never really did very well financially. He came back to D.C., but he ne still never saw a dime of the billions of dollars that that character made. There was an, another attempt in 1966 to get a second lawsuit, and when that happened, Siegel was fired from D.C., and they lost the lawsuit. So by 1975, um, things weren't going very well for him financially. He launched that publicity campaign I talked about that resulted in that 20 to 30K uh, stipend and benefits. But again, be aware, those benefits were never adjusted for inflation. He died of a heart attack, at which time that 30 sti 30K stipend, he died in 1996 of a heart attack. And at that time, if you had adjusted it for inflation, that 30K stipend would have been worth about 74K. But it was never adjusted for inflation. Siegel and Schuster got royally screwed. Superman's made billions, still does. And this is because U.S. copyright law, they never saw a damned thing. Even in 1975, 20 to 30K was damned little, particularly compared to what DC was making off of them. And again, those stipends were never adjusted for inflation. So as the cost of living went up, that meant they could buy less and less. So if you start here at 30K, and over the years, it goes, your cost of inflation causes cost of living to go up, you can buy less and less and less and less. But, th you know, by the time they died, it was a pittance. It was a complete pittance. And this is why U.S. copyright and patent law should be changed. It should be completely illegal for a company to own either a copyright or a patent. It should be totally illegal, completely illegal for a company. Those rights should always belong, as was intended by this copyright and patent system. Those copyrights and patents should always belong to the people who actually created something. Modern copyright and patent law is simply a travesty, and it needs to be changed right now. It should have been changed a hundred years ago, 
but it needs to be changed right now. No company, no company should ever own a copyright or a patent. That should belong to people who created something. And if the company wants to license that from them, say DC wants to license the Superman characters from Jerry Siegel and Joe Sister, then they get to see it. They get to see a money, a financial, a significant financial in, the, in terms of Superman, a financial benefit out of it, instead of what DC did, which was completely screw them into the ground because the law allows them to. That law needs to be changed, preferably about 100 years ago. Okay, getting back into the show, into this plot particularly. A lot of times in my reviews, I will go through the plot. I started to write it down. And as sometimes happens with movies like this, I discovered that it was complex enough. I was rewriting the whole damn thing. What's the point? You know, really, if you are a fan of superheroes or science fiction or fantasy or romance, for that matter, and you have not seen this film... Turn me off right now. Just turn me off. Go stream a copy. Come back and watch me in the archives. Believe me, you want to see this film if you have not. This is a brilliant film created by an army of very talented people behind the screens and a cast that was perfectly cast. Every single one of the people in this movie is perfect perfectly cast. As I said, it's the best Superman movie ever made, probably will be the best Superman movie ever made, and is one of the best, if not the best, superhero movies ever made. Watch this film if you have not, because your heart and your head are going to love you for the rest of your life. Cringe moments. Always like to get those out of the way. There's really only one cringe moment. I mean, you know, setting aside the science part of it with the uh, San Andreas fall. There is really only one cringe moment for this in me, and it's during the flying sequence um, when Lois Lane is narrating apparently what's going on in her head. What you have to understand is in that flying sequence, John Williams, Maestro John Williams, was writing the music for that at a time when both Leslie Ann Warren and Stockard Channing were being considered for the part of Lois Lane. So he wrote a vocal number. That thing was supposed to be sung. And the fact was, Margot Kidder couldn't sing. And so they had her just speak it. If you listen to the music, and some singers have recorded it as a song. If you listen to the music, Maestro John Williams' music, you can actually see how it was supposed to be sung. It was supposed to go something like, Can you read my mind? Do you know what it is you do to me? You can hear it. You can hear it. And as I say, some artists have uh, done that. I think uh, Barbara Streisand did it once. It sucks, but that's why it's there. Because at one time, there was a possibility they might have an actress who could sing. They should have kicked it. They should have just kicked it out. I've seen fan edits where they replace it with just the music, and it works wonderfully. They should have thrown it out. I don't know why they kept it. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, musical Superman. Well, you know, 1970s. Mentioned it in my, you can go back to the uh, life in the 1970s stuff. And, uh, you know, varieties were a thing. Um, so having that in there would have made a marginal amount of sense. I think it was stupid to do. They should have just gone with the music. If you see ones where they've replaced that music with just maestro John Williams' music it works perfectly you do not need that voiceover so i it, with me i would have taken it out yeah broadway had a superman musical in the 1960s it's a bird it's a plane it's superman i used to use one of those songs as one of my audition pieces when i was an actor Come on, pow, let's go, bam, I need a little exercise. Take that pow and that zonk. Let's see what you can do. I used to use that. <laughs> it's one of my, uh, that's how much Superman has meant to me my entire life. Nobody knew that song because it was not a particularly successful musical. And they did a TV adaptation, pieces of which are here on YouTube. It's kind of terrible. But uh, I did that song because nobody knew what it was, and it got me to do some singing while I got to jump around the stage and do things. Um, so it was an interesting little audition piece. 
Probably helped me get a job, which I'll talk about myself a little bit later. Great moments in this film. Damn near everything. But the opening in particular was brilliant. The opening starts out, you have to remember it, back in that day, the screens that you had in front of the theaters and big theaters like that had curtains on them. And so when the movie was about to start, the lights would fade down and the curtains would pull apart. And so what they did then with the film was first they did the, you know, the dedication to Jeffrey Unsworth, but then they faded in on curtains, just like you would have seen, but they were black and white. And then they parted to a four, a six, a four by three aspect ratio and showed a comic book. And then that comic book ripple faded into a black and white image of the Daily Planet building. And then they went farther out, the curtains opened completely, you had this much larger thing, they were going out into space, and then those titles came at you. That opening says clearly, it was intended to set something epic. It was saying very clearly, you have seen Superman in comics. You have seen Superman in this four by uh, three aspect ratio in black and white. You have never seen Superman the way we're about to do it. It was epic. It was incredibly epic. The way that that worked at the time, you know, I remember being absolutely stunned sitting there in the front row and this thing opens and I'm like, what? Okay, are we going to, is this a period piece or something? And then it all fades and it becomes something else and you're out in space and then all of these giant credits are coming toward you because again, I'm sitting front row center in a big screen with the sound system and it was, my God, you know, just an amazing experience and an incredible way to open that film. Uh, Larry Larry says, the theater pulled the curtains closed to a square and then opened wide for the titles. Yeah, as I say, they got this this uh, four by three aspect ratio, the same as you'd expect from an old movie. And then they had the they had the comic book in it. They were saying, you have seen Superman in comics. You have seen Superman in black and white movies. And then they opened it up and they said, this is how we're seeing Superman now. And so you had John, Maestro John Williams' incredible score, which I'll talk about later when I get to the music. And you had those giant titles just whooshing past, and it was astonishing. You, you, were, you were like, it's today, maybe it seems like those are too big or too long. But back then, when you didn't know, you know, that they were really going to do a thing where a man can fly, it was setting the stage. It was saying, this is epic. We have thought about this. This is an epic film. It is going to be nothing like any other Superman movie you've ever seen. And then they get to Krypton's sun, pan under it, go to Krypton, pan around some of its uh, cities, and get to that dome. And the first line you hear is brilliant. Jor-El says, this is no fantasy no careless product of wild imagination. So not only did you have this epic opening, but you had jor right there talking to the audience, because that's what he was doing. He was talking to the audience. It was in the context of something else, but he was talking to the audience. He was saying, you're about to see something that we have put work into and are taking seriously. And, and we've, it, it totally set the tone. One other, I mean, God, you know, there's so many great moments, and I'll just talk about them as I go through. God, I'm in a nine already, and I haven't even really gotten started. Krypton, in the comics, had never had interstellar flight, which didn't make a lot of sense. Now, it made sense in terms of when the comic first came out. You know, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster really couldn't imagine the concept of organized interstellar flight by a you know, advanced civilization. Later on in the comics, it should have been possible, but they never had it done. Here... For the first time, the Kryptonians have interstellar flight. It's just that in context of the movie, Jor-El and Lara are forbidden from using them. And so that's why they send Kal-El off in something that is an interstellar vehicle. In the comics, it had always been an experimental vehicle. This one, no, it's just an interstellar vehicle, which makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. In terms of other great moments, everything else, and I will talk about that as I go through. Now, the writer on this, I usually do the writers first, because without the written word, you ain't got nothing. You can do all the great casting and get all the great people together, 
But if you ain't got a good script, you ain't got nothing. And this film has a lot of writers in the credit, and that usually spoils the pot. It usually screws it up. If you go from one hand to the next hand to the next hand, and people are rewriting this and that and the other thing, it usually turns into a mess. And it did. But Richard Donner called an old friend that he'd worked with, Tom Mankiewicz, and Tom Mankiewicz rewrote this script. This script is Tom Mankiewicz's script. Make no mistake, despite the fact that there are a lot of names on there, it's just for legal reasons. They maybe contributed a plot point here or there, like Mario Puzo is credited. He did The Godfather. He's credited in this. Maybe a plot point or two. But the script, putting it all together, making a four-act script, a discrete, four, clear, four-act script that flows together and works. This is Tom Mankiewicz. Everything here is Tom Mankiewicz. The amazing thing is he didn't get a screenwriter credit for it. In IMDb, it shows screenwriter because he was. But for union and legal reasons, he couldn't do that. He took a creative consultant credit. But make no mistake, this is Tom Mankiewicz's script. Forget all the other names on there. They're just there for legal reasons. The one writer on this was Tom Mankiewicz. Uh, the white crystal motif for Krypton was brilliant. abso fracking lutely Larry, Larry. Krypton, while it doesn't seem like that today, it seems because comic books, that's another thing. That's another thing. Comic books picked up that whole crystal motif in comics, which is there now to this day, from this film. Krypton, as shown in this film, is unlike any other alien film, alien planet ever put to screen. And the fact that they had this crystal-based architecture was totally unusual both for Superman and for films in general. It was, I'll get to it when I get to the production design, but it was amazing production design. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Don't know necessarily whether that was Mankiewicz's idea, but the production design was fantastic. Because again, as you say, the white crystals had never been seen ever on any screen anywhere. Nothing like this alien planet had ever been put to screen. This was the first time that had ever been done. Now, Tom Mankiewicz, he was around here from 1942 to 2010. His IMDb goes to 2012. Uh, his IMDb runs 1966 to 2012. In reality, he actually worked between 1966 and 1990. I'm sorry, 1966 and 1996. Um, his one 2012 posthumous credit is uh, because he used an excerpt of some kind from Superman in the TV series Young Justice. He has 20 writer credits, two of which are for Heart to Heart. You're going to see this pop up a lot in his IMDb because he had a lot to do with Heart to Heart. It's a TV series uh, that's about a pair of uh, married detectives and a romance story as well uh, that he did very well. He has six director credits, which include, by the way, 13 episodes of Heart to Heart. He has eight miscellaneous crew credits, three of which are for Superman 1 and 2, but also one of them is miscellaneous crew for 107 episodes of Heart to Heart. I uh, don't know what that means exactly in terms of miscellaneous crew, um, but clearly he had a lot of influence on Heart to Heart. It's all over his IMDb if you look. He has three producer credits and almost exclusively film, except for all this work he did on Heart to Heart. Now, as I've often said, I say it over and over, you know, Oscars are okay, Emmys are fine, but if you really want to impress me, you have to win the Hugo Award. And he was not winner, but he was nominated in 1986 for Lady Hawk, which was also directed by Richard Donner. Now, in terms of the writing, what can I say except perfect? Pitch perfect in every respect. The part, like I say, four acts. Krypton, Growing up, Metropolis, saving the world. Those are the four acts of this film. And he makes them work together. He makes them flow together. And what, like I say, that Krypton one, perfect. Because to begin with, right at the beginning of that, they're setting up for Superman 2. That's what that beginning part is. With the criminals, is setting up Superman 2. And, you know, they don't do much there. But, by God, man, Terrence Stamp Azad still has a performance that they stole wholesale for Man of Steel, only went bigger with it. 
But he has a great performance in there, even for the three minutes that he's in it. But that was setting up that. But the rest of it, you know, all perfect sense. And given the production design with all the crystal stuff, beautiful, wonderful, amazing stuff we'd never seen before. And what really pleased me, as somebody who has spent a lot of time in rural South Dakota, was the fact that when we get to the growing up portion of it in Smallville, he does it right. He's not like modern writers who will treat people like that as hicks and rubes and hayseeds that don't know a damn thing. He does it right. He does it with respect to how reality actually is in places like that and how it influences Superman as a character. People wonder why Superman, a guy with this kind of power, doesn't just take over the world. Why is he going around doing good things all the time? Why is he such a goody two-shoes? Well, it's because he grew up in a rural area, a very rural area, where that's necessary. You can't just ignore your neighbors when they are in trouble. You must help them. And so that molds Superman's characters. It's why modern writers just don't get him. That rural background is so totally radically different from an urban background that it completely molds his character in terms of what he does and why he does it. He is not a do-gooder. He is a man who grew up in a rural area that requires him to do good deeds, just as a matter of course. That's why he does them. Larry Larry says, Glenn Ford was perfect. Oh, wait till I get to the characters. Everybody in this, everybody was perfectly cast. There is not a single person that's badly cast in this film. And then Superman goes to Metropolis. New York City was where they shot it. Thank God they did. It looks real. Um, but he goes to New York City. That part of it is handled incredibly well as well. And then saving the world at the end incredibly well handled the ending in particular which is not the ending that they originally planned to do and i'll get into that when i talk about superman 2 and, and the production issues but the ending is incredibly powerful you know when when lois lane is dying that is still a sequence that is very hard for me to watch because margot kidder we got her ill she's my lois lane that is still a very difficult scene for me to watch. And so when Superman just screams no and goes off, that is an extraordinarily powerful moment for me, still to this day. Um, I can't say much more about it. It is it, perfectly done. And the fact that it is a romance, this is at heart. Superman is two things at heart. He is a science fiction character. He works best when he's dealing with somebody like Lex Luthor, a genius who is doing scientific things. And it is a romance. It is a romance between two people who fell in love at first sight. You can see it in the film when it happens. Clark Kent falls in love with Lois Lane the first time he sees her in Perry White's office. After that, his eyes never leave her. When she's in the room, he's watching her. And if it wasn't anybody but Clark Kent, it might be creepy. But, you know, he's such an inoffensive guy. It's not. But if you watch, after that, he is constantly watching her. If, he, if she's in the room, he's on, her, his eyes are on her. And then when Superman saves Lois, I didn't get a still for it because I couldn't quite get the exact moment. But there is a precise moment when Superman saves her, and I think it's right after she says, you've got me, who's got you? And she looks at Superman right then. You can tell she has fallen in love with him. And from that moment on, her eyes are never off him when he's around. And when they are together, oh, the chemistry between those actors completely sells that. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, but they meet on the side of a building. Well, Superman meets her on the side of the building, but that's not when he fell in love with her. He fell in love with her as Clark Kent when he met, met her in Perry White's office. She fell in love with him moments after he rescued her. It is perfectly written. It is perfectly cast. It is perfectly made. It is an incredible movie. And 
the, as I say, the writing is perfect. The writing is perfect. You have these four distinct acts where four different types of things are going on, and they all flow into each other. It's not like, you know, a lot of the early Marvel movies where you have the origin, and then you have some other story, and they don't really fit that well together. This one fits together perfectly in every respect. Characters. Well, of course, there is Christopher Reeve as Superman. And Christopher Reeve will forever be my Superman. And if you watch this movie and he's not your Superman, you have been conditioned by a lifetime of crappy movies to be dead inside. Now, Christopher Reeve, as most people know, had something of a tragic issue. Uh, he lived from 1952 to 2004, died at the age of 52. I'm a year older than he is when he died. He died from complications of an accident that occurred on May 27, 1995 in which he was paralyzed in a horseback riding accident. He never regained the use of his body. He could not even breathe without mechanical assistance. And yet, this did not stop him from working at his craft. And any personal appearance you see him in, from, from the time it happened until his death, he remained completely upbeat and optimistic the whole time. He was a man completely paralyzed, needed everything done for him, could not breathe on his own, and yet when he was in, whenever he was in public, and I assume in his private life, completely upbeat, completely optimistic. I'm going to go into this at some point. I don't know how long this review is going to be. I'm going to go into some point in some detail about how Hollywood is a wretched hive of scum and villainy. But Christopher Reeve soared above all that. And that's why Christopher Reeve made me believe a man can fly. And I still do. Now Reeve's IMDb went 1974 to 2004. Um, he worked right up until he, was, uh, until he died. And a lot of it was long after he was paralyzed. He has 47 acting credits, seven of which were after he was paralyzed. And he did uh, two episodes of Smallville. He has five producer credits, all of which were after he was paralyzed, which includes uh, 16 episodes of the uh, show Freedom, A History of Us. He has three director credits, all of which were after he was paralyzed. He has two writing credits, one for Superman 4, the less said about the better. But after he was paralyzed, he wrote an episode of The Practice, in which he also acted. And he has two soundtrack credits. Uh, Larry Larry says he was at the front of stem cell research for rehabilitation of nerves and muscles. Yes, he absolutely was. He absolutely was. And he was so upbeat. Every time you saw him in any public appearance, the man was not down about himself. He had hope that someday he would be walking again. And I think if he had lived maybe another 30 or 40 years, might well have happened for him. It might well have happened. But he was still upbeat. He still worked in his craft. And he won awards. Um, he won a primetime Emmy in 1997 after he was paralyzed for Outstanding Informational Special for the film Without Pity, a film about abilities. He won the BAFTA in 1979 for Most Promising Newcomer for leading a uh, role for men in Superman. He won the Fantas Festival in 1981, Best Actor for Somewhere in Time, which is another good movie. He won a Grammy in 1999 after he was paralyzed for Best Spoken al Album for Still Me. He won the Jules Verne Award in 2004, a Lifetime Achievement Award. He won the Online Film and Television Association Award in 1997 after he was paralyzed for Best Direction of a Motion Picture or Miniseries for In the Gloaming. He won the Screen Actors Guild Award in 1999 after he was paralyzed for Outstanding Performance by a Male Actor in a TV Movie or Miniseries for Rear Window. He won the Young Artists Award in 1996 after he was paralyzed for the Jackie Cougar Coogan Award for his Inspiration to Youth. Getting misty-eyed about this guy because he was such an inspiration. 
He got his star on the Walk of Fame in 1997 after he was paralyzed for motion pictures, and he had 13 other nominations, 10 of which were after he was paralyzed. His performance in this is perfect. He is my Superman. Now, he was 24 when he got this role. He was playing a bit older. But Superman was his fifth credited role. And although he was a very active theatrical actor before and after this. Uh, Larry says, Somewhere in, Somewhere in Time was a great film of his. Yeah, yeah, it was. Somewhere, Somewhere in Time is a good film. It's outside my usual time period, but um, I have holes next year. Maybe I'll do Somewhere in Time. But he was perfect for this role. No one has ever played Superman as well as Chris Lee. And I can't imagine that his performance will ever be topped. Because his most important choice as an actor, you know, actors make choices about how they're going to do things all the time. How am I going to deliver this line? Why am I going to do this? Why am I doing that? And every choice he made... And every choice made by every actor on this was pitch perfect. Absolutely perfect for what he needed. And his best choice, his biggest choice, was that he decided that for Lois Lane to not look like a complete idiot, Superman must be an extraordinary actor. Hey, Marshall, haven't seen me play Superman. There's a good reason for that, too. Yeah, well, I ain't going to play Superman. <laughs> Nick Cage auditioned for Superman. Yeah, he did for a, a, an aborted movie, uh, Superman. Uh, I've forgotten. It was before the Superman Returns one. Um, it's interesting to watch. There's some videos of him out there because the costumes, they were testing on him. They were just test costumes. Looked horrifying. Um, and they did a lot of test costumes for him. I don't think, honestly, it's hard for me to imagine Nick Cage as Superman. Not after Chris Reeve. It's hard to imagine. But his most important um, choice, Bill Shatner should have auditioned. <laughs> I don't think Bill Shatner had it. I really don't. And I'm going to explain why. His most important choice that he made in this movie was that, that Superman was an extraordinary actor so that the glasses would carry it. I mean, really. You know, it's stupid. Here's my glasses. Have I suddenly changed into someone you don't recognize? No, of course not. He had to be. Superman must have been a great actor in order for this to work. And it did. And I want to show you a picture that, uh, you know, kind of tells you of what I'm talking about here. This is from a single scene in this film uh, where Superman has just flown off after the flying sequence and Clark Kent shows up. And I want you to t notice several things. The first is, on the far right, Superman has an extraordinarily amazing smile. That is Chris Reeves' normal smile. He has a, a magnetic, incredible smile that when he does it, it, brings, it, it brightens the room. Some people have smiles like that. Now, if you look on the far left, when he's doing Clark Kent, Clark Kent doesn't have that smile. Because Superman is an extraordinary actor. And then we see the middle one. We can see him where he's actually playing Clark Kent. And, he's, and he's, he's hunched over a little bit. And he's, you know, kind of looking down. And then in the film, I don't have a copy. And I don't dare put a click up, uh, clip up because I'll probably get a copyright strike. I'm going to, um, that may possibly happen with something else I'm going to do later in the review. Chris Reeve does something that I recognize as an actor because it was very, very useful to me as an actor. I still try to do it today. I'm not that great at it all the time, but I try. He is using something called Alexander Technique. Um, Shatner could be Perry White. Yeah, he could have been, but I think the actor they got, I think it's better. Uh, do I have one sequence where he goes between uh, Superman to Clark. Well, this is the best I can do. Because I don't want to do a clip. I could get copyright reassignments, and I don't want to do that. Or community guideline strikes. Lost my last channel over that. Anyway, if we watch what happens here, if you actually watch what he does between here, he does something called Alexandering Up. This is something I recognize because this was one of the most useful things for me when I was acting. was what's called the Alexander Technique. Now, I can show you what that is. It's not posture. It's not him standing up straight. 
What he's using is the Alexander Technique. You can find some information about it on YouTube if you search around. It was something that I got into because it was very, very useful for me as an actor, more so than method acting. And it's where you imagine that you have an invisible string that brings you up into the universe somewhere. In my case, I was big into Aikido, still am, and so I used the concept of energy, key. Let me show you how this works. So I'm sitting like this, and I sit like this a lot, unfortunately, at this screen. But what I do is allow my head to move up, and then my body follows. You let your head move up, and your body follows. That is called Alexandering Up. That is what Chris Reeve is doing in that scene. I've watched him do it so many times, and I've recognized it. He is Alexandering Up. It's amazing. He, he knew about that. He used that as a technique. Fracking amazing, you know. Uh, YouTube, something at 31 seconds. Is that where the point where he's uh, doing um, uh, the upright thing? That'd be cool. Um, as I say, I can't really put it on because God knows what they do to me anymore. But there is that body language. There is definitely that body language. Yeah, the Alexander technique, that's what he's using. But there's all the, also the body language he's doing. Superman has this dazzling smile. It's Chris Reeves' natural smile. He, Clark Kent does not have that. He can Alexander up. We get the difference there. We can see it immediately. It's awesome. In terms of the rest of the performance, he is pitch perfect. He is pitch perfect. Every single choice that he makes as an actor is perfect. It works exactly the way it's supposed to. There is one specific thing that he did that I know from reading and watching backstage stuff, which was his choice. And this is just an example of all the choices he was making in terms of making this perfect. After Lois dies, he takes her out of the, uh, of the car, lays her on the ground, and there's a moment where her head balls fall back. And he goes, uh, you know, just a small little thing, which was perfect. He was saying, you know, he was showing that Superman cares so much about her even after she's dead. If her head's going to fall, he's like, uh, like that, I, she might get hurt. It was perfect. He does this throughout the whole thing. Perfect, 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 perfect. Every time that he says, um, uh, Larry, Larry and uh, Marshall are talking about uh, uh, Dave Prowse. Yeah, I have some info on that. Again, I'm not sure how substantiated it is, but it is certainly true, and I'll talk about that in very short order, uh, about the workout that Chris Reeve did go into to become Superman for this. But Superman makes tons of choices like that, Chris Reeve does. And in particular, I love when Lois Lane says, so what are you here? Why are you here? And Superman very matter-of-factly just says, I'm here to fight the truth, justice, and the American way. It's totally straight. That's exactly how Superman should do it. And it works perfectly. You know, and people might laugh a little bit now, but as I explained toward the beginning, no, the American way is perfect. A sm small, limited government that does not interfere with its citizens' freedoms and, if anything, protects those freedoms. And that's what he means by the American way. Again, his performance is perfect. Just perfect. It is perfect in every respect. Every single choice that he makes is perfect. Now, uh, there is the notion of what he did to get bigger. Chris Reeve, when he was signed for this role, was six foot four and only 188 pounds, way too skinny. And Donner, Richard Donner, the director and the producers, wanted him to wear a muscle suit, and he said, no, not going to do that. So he went into a training regimen that is recorded as 10 weeks of a training regimen in which he would do a morning run, two hours of resistance training, and then 90 minutes of trampoline exercises, which makes sense considering the amount of time that they had him on wires. <laughs> Uh, his initial reaction to the first time he did this, and I quote, I went into the locker room and heaved. And as somebody who knows a little bit about bodybuilding, yeah, yeah, if you start out doing that cold, yeah, happened to me once, uh, you can go into the locker room and heave. Um, according to l at least legend, and I believe I have seen one picture with Prouse and Reeve, 
a long time ago. I can't remember it, so it's hard to substantiate. But I believe I have seen one picture with that. Supposedly, this whole training regimen was made up by uh, Dave Prowse. Now, Dave Prowse was a bodybuilder and a weightlifter. And he's probably most famous because he was the played the body of Darth Vader in the first three Star Wars movies. Um, I was told that uh, Prowse wanted to get uh, Superman, but they never got an audition. And if you look at Dave Prowse's face, um, you know, he's, got the, he's got the physique for it, but he ain't got this dazzling Superman smile. He's not right for it in terms of that. Uh, Reeve also apparently went on a diet, which makes sense if you're going to bulk up like that, if you're not using steroids, and one doesn't know whether maybe that happened. If you're not using steroids, you're going to eat a lot. You go to four meals a day, very, very high in protein. You know, uh, Done that myself. And now I've got the diabetes, so I have to worry about that. Um, but he eventually did get 33 more pounds at one point and uh, eventually settled in at about 212 pounds with two extra inches of muscle on his chest. And this impacted his performance. Um, he said himself that the fact that he now was much bigger made him feel like he was Superman. And this is why some of his, you know, his choices as Superman tend to be understated. You know, when he's just being Superman, he's not like anybody that should go, yes, I'm Superman, I'm Superman. He's just understated. I'm, I'm the guy who can save the world. Um, just the way things are. You know, Lois interviews him, and he's just like, mm, well, how do you, much do you weigh? Uh, 2, 225. You know, he's not, he's totally understated about it. And that's because he was that by then. So it was great. He, he has a great, great performance. He got lots of critical acclaim for it, and deservedly so, and went on to play the character in three sequels, only one of which was any good. Uh, although I will tell you that Superman 3 and Superman 4, there is a uh, fan added out there. I think it's called Superman Redeemed that takes those two movies and forms them into something that at least makes some sense. I don't think it's a great film, but it throws out a lot of the stupid um, and puts in things that at least make a little more sense. So. All right, off of Chris Reeve, finally. <laughs> Must have spent 20 minutes or a half hour on him. Margot Kidder as Lois Lane. Now, Margot Kidder lived 1948 till this year, 2018, struggled with drug and alcohol addiction for much of her life. And in fact, when she died, her death was classified as a suicide by drug and alcohol overdose. Now, her IMDb goes 1968 to 2017 with 136 acting credits. Got to point these people out as usual when you get the kind of acting credits, the number of them everywhere we're going to see on this movie has. They are what we call workers. They are really supporting themselves at acting, which most actors don't do. I say the same thing over and over because it's true. There are thousands of actors out there whose names you will never know unless you're at an upscale restaurant and they happen to sign the check that they give over to you to pay. You'll otherwise never know who they are. There are thousands of them out there. So for her to have 136 acting credits from 1968 to uh, 2017 is great. And, of course, she did, by the way, two episodes of Smallville. She did largely film until about 1983, and then she started doing TV with multiple series and multiple regulars. She did win a bunch of awards. She won. Uh, Margo was kidding. Uh, Larry Larry says Margo was appearing at many cons before her death. Yes, she was. She was a frequent uh, convention guest. Absolutely, yeah. She won awards, the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and uh, Horror Films Award in 1979, Best Actress for Superman. She won the Inter Action on Film International Film Festival Award in 2016 for Outstanding Cast Performance Feature for The Red Maple Leaf. She won the Canadian Film Awards twice, once in 1969, Special Award in Recognition of an Outstanding New Talent, and then in 1975, Best Performance by a Lead Actress for two movies, a Quiet Day in Belfast and a Black Christmas. She won a Daytime Emmy in 2015 for Outstanding Performer in a Children's or Preschool child Children's Series for R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour. She won the Genie Award in 1982, Best Actress for The Box Collector. And she won the Shuckerfest Award in 19, I'm sorry, 2004, Best Actress for Death for 
uh, told. That's with a four. Death foretold. Her performance. She is and always will be my Lois Lane, just as Chris Reeve is my Superman. She was a bit older than Chris Reeve, but it didn't show, and uh, they were both playing about the same age. And as with everyone else in this film, she is perfectly cast for this role. Now, there is an edge to this character that I really wasn't expecting when I went to see it. You know, you, you see the character in comics, you don't necessarily, but you see this edge to her. But the thing about that is, it's a choice. It's a choice of hers to do. Because when Superman is around, the edge goes away. And she turns into what we see in this picture, which I took of her. This is where she has had the edge go away while she's talking to Superman. It's perfect. It is part of what sells the romance. And this is, as I say, at the heart of it. This is a romance story. And she had, with Chris Reeve, an extraordinary amount of chemistry. And that's really, really important to sell a love story. If you don't have two actors who really have the chemistry together, you're not going to get a little enough story. But these two actors, Chris Reeve and Margot Kidder, had extraordinary chemistry together. And that is why it all works so well. It is why it's one of the few times I can sit and watch a romance and really enjoy it. Um, otherwise, as with everybody else in this film, all of her choices are pitch perfect. Just pitch perfect. Perfect. Now, people like to complain that she screams a lot in this film. I disagree. She screams a lot in the helicopter sequence. But um, let's say you're stuck in a helicopter that's slowly falling off the edge and you look down 30 stories. I'm going to scream. I'm really going to scream. I'm going to be scared as frack, and I'm going to scream. And she also in that, by the way, when she's screaming help, most of the time it's up because she knows there's a couple of guys standing up there that maybe can open the door and help pull them out. The other time she's screaming is when she falls um, and during the flying sequence. But then that is totally turned around. And again, you're flying, falling out of the air, you know, from how knows how far up. So... You're falling down, of course, you're going to scream, but then that's totally turned around. The instant Superman saves her, it becomes a far more intimate moment that works really well with that love story. And the other time she's screaming is when she's dying. Uh, I'm sorry if my car gets falls into a crack in the ground and I'm getting crushed and full of water, full of uh, dirt. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to cry too. I'm going to scream. <laughs> Who wouldn't? So, you know, you want to get, you want to get her for that, hey, no, man, put yourself in that situation. And you tell me you would not be screaming like a little girl, because I would. Now, another one that's perfectly cast, amazingly enough, was Marlon Brando as jor uh, He lived 1924 to 2004. Now, I have a ton of respect for Mar Marlon Brando, not just because I was once an actor, and at that time he was somebody I looked up to and studied what he did a lot. also studied Lord Olivier, Lord Lawrence Olivier. They were my two real big ones. Um, but I have a lot of respect for him, not just because of his acting, but because as a person, um, which you'll see in some of what I'm going to be talking about here in a minute. Now, his IMDb is 1949 to 2006, despite the fact he died two years earlier. Um, he actually quit working in 2000, excuse me, in 2001. He has one posthumous credit. It's for the voice of Don Vito Corleone in The Godfather video game. He otherwise has 46 acting credits, which isn't a ton over the period, but it's more than it's about one a year. And he did exclusively film, except the only one real thing that uh, he did on TV that was noteworthy was he played a character in Roots, The Next Generation, which was a not so good sequel to the very acclaimed Roots miniseries, which I'll talk about again in a moment. Marlon Brando, amazingly enough, was born in Omaha, Nebraska, that uh, metro area of one million that's about half an hour from me. However, at the time, it was a totally different kind of city way back then, much smaller. He was from a uh, less than desirable family. His father was an abusive alcoholic, among other things. He basically ran, ran away. And Larry Larry says, method actor personified. Yes, he very much was. My next statement, he was one of the pioneers of method acting in films. Uh, so I have to describe that. Method acting 
uh, was created by Konstantin Stanislavsky in Russia, Soviet Union at the time. And it was a way to replace what had been declamatory acting. That's what you see in early, early films where people are posing and doing very dramatic things. That's declamatory acting. It was a style of acting that was popular for hundreds of years. Method acting brought it down to what you're really trying to do is figure out what your character motivation is at any given moment. And you hear that a lot. What's my character's motivation? The reason you hear a lot is because nobody in real life just does things. We all do things for a reason. We have a motivation for doing something. We have a reason for it. And so in, in doing this, you get rid of that declamatory acting in favor of something that's far more realistic. It's also intended to bring out some real emotion so that you can have more realistic portrayal. That part of it never worked for me. Uh, Alexander Technique worked a hell of a lot better. When I'm sitting here and trying to do Alexander Technique and I'm getting misty, partly it's because I'm trying to Alexander up most of the time. Um, he was also considered, he, he was not somebody that we in fandom necessarily thought was going to be a good jor because he was considered something of a guy who mumbled through his performances and uh, often was kind of semi-coherent. He also got a <laughs> bad reputation for being a really terrible person to work with. He had, some, he had some really different ideas about what he wanted to do for performing. Regardless, he did win two Oscars for his most iconic roles on The Waterfront and The Godfather, in which his style for that was perfect. It was perfect for what he was doing. And despite being someone who did sustain himself at his craft, he didn't work excessively. He didn't have to. He'd made a ton of money on the ones he'd done. He generally chose his roles very carefully. He could afford to do that. And he was not even particularly fond of acting. I'll give you some quotes. One of them is running on my lower third, and we'll stay there for quite some time because I, when I found it, it was amazing. These are all individual quotes taken out of, I don't know what context they're in. Some of the things he said were, I don't think any movie is a work of art. Acting is hustling. An actor's guy who, if you ain't talking about him, he ain't listening. Acting is an empty and useless profession. If I hadn't been an actor, I've often thought that I would have become a con man and would have wound up in jail. An actor is at most a poet and at least an entertainer. The only thing an actor owes his public is not to bore them. Would people applaud me if I were a good plumber? I'm just another son of a bitch sitting in a motorhome on a film set and they come looking for Zeus. Never confuse the size of your paycheck with the size of your talent. I'm only in Hollywood because I don't have the moral courage to refuse the money. Hollywood is a small-minded little town in the middle of nowhere. Acting is the expression of a neurotic impulse. It's a bum's life. Quitting acting is a sign of maturity. And this is the one that part of it is coming in my lower third. I'm not a film fanatic. If I never saw another movie in my life, it wouldn't bother me. Acting is what I do to make my money, but it certainly isn't my lifestyle. Compared to world affairs, a peace conference, making a movie is absolutely nothing. Big old round o applause for Marlon Brando for that last statement. Would that the uh, social justice warrior... Um, socialist communists who come into all the awards and just go nuts with it. Now, Brando did do one thing, but I'm in that particular case, I'm going to say I agree with him. He won the Oscar in 1955 for Best uh, Actor in a Leading Role for On the Waterfront. 1973, he won it again for Best Actor in a Leading Role for The Godfather. He did not attend that ceremony. Instead, he had an American Indian woman, uh, Sashin Littlefeather, uh, who came and she uh, said that Brando was respectfully uh, refusing the award due to poor treatment of American Indians in entertainment. I don't usually agree with actors doing this sort of thing at awards ceremonies. In this case, I do. 
And that's because what you're looking here at is modern day life on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. These are people, I have been there. I have seen them and talked to them. These are a conquered, broken people. The alcoholism rate is so close to 100% that it doesn't matter. The number of children born with fetal alcohol syndrome is extraordinary. What you're seeing here in this picture where they're bathing that baby in a tub, that tub has been used for who knows how many other things over the course of decades. And what you're seeing there with stuff laying around in the lawn, it's not because they can't be bothered to pick up their garbage. It's because they're so poor, they don't dare throw anything away. And it may not fit in the house, so they leave it outside. You don't dare fit, throw anything away because you may need that for some other purpose. You don't dare throw anything away. And you notice the outhouse on the left. That's real. That outhouse is real. I've been there. Some of those people live in shanties or broken down old um, uh, motorhomes that have no insulation and the windows are out because they can't afford to fix them. It is a place of utter hopelessness. The best way I can describe it is that they have been broken. They are completely broken. They have no hope. They have never had any hope for a century or more now. Generation after generation after generation of people with no hope, turning to alcohol, turning to drugs, because what hope do you have? Well, Larry, Larry, the Indian casinos don't help because they're off in a place in South Dakota that nobody would ever go to. You know, the only people who even know about them are people who are, I like to call myself a South Dakota living abroad. I know about it. Some of the people in South Dakota know about it. But nobody really knows. This is a national disgrace. These people have no hope. Their only hope is some of them get off the res. Most of them take the government check that barely keeps them alive. And they accumulate stuff like what you're seeing here. They bathe their children in what they can find. It is an utter national disgrace. And because of that, that one time that Marlon Brando did that, I actually agree. I wish somebody knew more about that. I wish people knew more about it. It is an utter national disgrace. It should, those people need help. They need a ton of help. And they have no hope. They are a conquered, broken people and have been for generations. They have no hope at all. I have seen it. I've heard one of their uh, some people, who, a guy who works as a social worker out there talk about it. No hope. They have no hope for anything. It needs to change. Okay, going on with uh, things that Marlon Brando won. He won the Golden Globe Award in 1955 for Best Actor for On the Waterfront. Golden Globe again in 1956. He won a Henrietta Award for the World Film Favorite. 1973, he won two Best Actor for The Godfather and Henrietta Award for World Film Favorite. And the Golden Globe again in 1974 for Henrietta Award World Film Favorite. Won a Primetime Emmy in 1979 for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Limited Series or Special for Roots, The Next Generation. He won the BAFTA three times, once in 1953 for Best Foreign Actor for Viva Zapata, again in 1954 for Julius Caesar, Caesar, and again in 1955 for On the Waterfront. Won the Cannes Film Festival Best Actor Award in Viva Zapata. Won the David Di Natalo Best, uh, Best uh, Foreign Actor Award in 1958 for Sayonara. Won the Golden Apple Awards in 1961. I said he had a reputation for this. He got a sour apple for Least Cooperative Actor. He won the Jesse Awards in 1952 for, four, for three films, for an actor, for A Streetcar Named Desire, and The Men. And he also won 1973 the Jesse Award for Actor of the Year. Won the Italian Online Movie Awards in 2004, a lifetime achievement. Won the Kansas City Film Critics Circle Award in 1972, Best Actor for The Godfather. Won the Laurel Award in 1958, Top Male Dramatic Performance for The Young Gun, Lions, sorry, Young Lions. The National Society of Film Critics Award in 1974, Best Actor for Last Tango in Paris. 1953 and 1974 won the, 19, uh, won the New York Film Critics Circle Award the first time for Best Actor in On the Waterfront and the second time Best Actor for Last Tango in Paris. 
Uh, he won the Online Film and Television Association Award. He was inducted to their Hall of Fame for acting in 2000. Won the San Sebastian International Film Festival Award in 1961. He got a golden seashell for One-Eyed Jacks. Won the Tokyo International Film Festival Award in 1989. Best Actor for a Dry White Season. The Western Heritage Award in 1967. He got a Bronze Wrangler for Up the Appaloosa. He got his star on the Walk of Fame in 1960 for Motion Pictures. And just to prove that sometimes you can be bad, even if he's as talented as he was, he won the Stinker Bad Movie Award in 1996, Worst Supporting Actor for The Island of Dr. Moreau, and a Razzie that same year for Worst Supporting Actor for The Island of Dr. Moreau. So he could do bad work, but not here. He was perfect. At the time, fans were very worried. I mean, this is the guy who was, was well, Mega Manovery can't refuse. And we're like, this guy is going to do Jorel, but no, he was fine. He was perfect. He he does a really good British accent. He 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 enunciates. He talks. Um, we weren't expecting this, but he was doing very well. But by this time, he'd stopped learning his lines. When he did The Godfather, he stopped learning his lines, and I'll quote him when he said this: um, "Unless an actor, a director, just got pissed and forced him to, he didn't learn them." He, he said it on this on The Godfather. I had signs and cue cards everywhere, on my shirt sleeves, on a watermelon, and glued to the scenery. Not memorizing lines increased the illusion of reality and spontaneity. And he did this also with Superman. When he's looking around, down, up, he's actually reading his lines from somewhere. Now, does this make him a be did this make him a better actor? No, I don't think so. I really don't. Personally, I think it just made him lazy. You know, he was extraordinarily talented. He knew he could get away with it. He'd, you know, he'd memorize them and directors screamed at him enough. I just think he discovered that he could get away with not doing it, and so he didn't. I think that's all that happened. I think an actor, you know, you have to, one of your responsibilities is to learn your lines. It's just one of the first things, learn your lines, and then learn how to play the reality through it. As one of my, you know, my, my own acting guru, the late, great Dr. William Morgan once said, Theater is planned, rehearsed, spontaneity. It's perfect, perfect quote. Um, and he just said, ah, screw it, I don't need to learn my lines anymore. Nobody's going to care anymore. I'm too big, I can do whatever I want. Now, he played Jarrell perfectly. He is not in the film a hell of a lot, but he plays that role perfectly. It is exactly what you need for Jarrell. And you can't nothing bad with his performance. Now he does have a six degrees of Star Trek because he played the character George Lincoln Rockwell in the TV miniseries Roots The Next Generation. And Roots The Next Generation was a sequel to the TV miniseries Roots in which LeVar Burton played Kuta Kinte and of course LeVar Burton played Jordi LaForge in Star Trek The Next Generation. One always has to wonder, you know, did somebody like Gene Roddenberry get a little bit of inspiration for the name of that, for maybe Roots, the next generation? Who knows? Who knows? As Lara, um, Superman's uh, biological mother, Susanna York. Uh, her IMDb is 1959 to 2010. She worked right up to the end with 108 acting credits. She was also an accomplished stage actress. She did a mi mix of film and TV with multiple TV series and multiple regulars and multiple recurring roles. She won the BAFTA in 1971 for Best Supporting Actress for They Shoot Horses, Don't They? And the Cannes Film Festival Award in 1972 Best Actress for Images, and she has seven, had seven other nominations. Uh, yeah, his face and voice continues to this day in Superman projects. Yeah, um, even in Superman Returns, which is a weird movie and kind of crappy, they did successfully pull off... Um, CGIing his face from existing footage that had already been shot for Superman 1 and 2. So, and yes, that is one of the things too that um, comics picked up from this movie. Comics picked up a number of things from this movie. The crystal architecture for sure, but also the look and feel of Jor-El. But um, Lara isn't here very much. She's mostly exposition. For Jarrell, that's mostly what she does. Um, you know, the Jarrell is telling the audience through her. You know, going to send him to Earth. There are thousands of years behind us. He'll need that to survive. He's going to have great powers and all that. 
we didn't have that conversation, then the audience wouldn't know these things, although I'm not sure that they needed to, really. But uh, she does well with what she's given. She's convincing when she puts her baby into the uh, thing and sees it for the last time. And then there's Glenn Ford. Glenn Ford as Jonathan Kent. His IMDb went 1937 to 1991. He passed away in 2006. He had 109 acting credits, also a worker. He was a very, very familiar face by this time. He uh, did almost exclusively film with some TV miniseries. And again, a very, very well-known face by this time. He had just come off of a couple of other movies. Um, I'm blanking on the one that I really remember him in. Um, but he, he did some military movies that he's very well known for. And just a, a very well-known face to this day. He won the Golden Globes in 1962 for Best Actor, Comedy, or Musical for Pocketful of Miracles. He won the Cindy Award in 1964, uh, Special Achievement for Recruiting or Indoctrination for Taiwan, Island of Freedom. Won the Golden Apples in 1948, Golden Apple for Most Cooperative Actor. And again in 1957, same thing, Most Cooperative Actor. He won the Golden Boot Award in 1987 for uh, just a Golden Boot. It just one may have been a uh, life achievement or something. Uh, he won the Laurel Awards in 1959 for Top Male uh, Comedy Performer for Don't Go Near the Water. Did the San Sebastian International Film Festival Award in 1987, a lifetime achievement. Got his star on the Walk of Fame in 1960 for Motion Pictures. Yes, and he did some great film noir. Yes, uh, Glenn Ford was a great actor. He was a great actor all the way around, and he is perfectly cast here. It is a perfectly cast choice. While he does not have that much screen time, it's another thing where you've got chemistry. Chemistry between he and Jeff East with the one really heart-to-heart -heart talk that he has with Clark. This defines what Superman would become. A powerful man who's here for a reason. I don't know whose reason, whatever the reason is. Maybe it's just, I don't know. But I do know one thing. It's not to score touchdowns. And that whole exchange is so perfect. And it's, again, it's defining some of what Superman would become. He's not a bully. He's not somebody out to get something. He's out there to do good, like he was grown up with, as I mentioned at the beginning. Being in a rural environment means you grow up with needing to do good deeds for your neighbors. It is a really powerful scene when he has that one with Clark, especially when he has his heart attack, which is really interesting because he plays it really realistically. Uh, apparently, when you're having a heart attack, the first place you feel it is in your left arm. And and he was having this heart attack, and he was holding his left arm, and then just went, oh, no. And, and, and it's perfect. It is perfect. Perfect, 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 perfect. The only thing that about Glenn Ford that was a little odd, and it wasn't that odd, really, movie stars of his era tended to think that they had a good side and a bad side for their face. Glenn Ford thought he had a good side. If you watch... He kind of insisted, and he was still a cooperative actor, but he kind of insisted, like a lot of actors and actresses did at that time, shoot my good side. So if you watch, most of the time you're only going to see one side of his face, and that's because of that. But he is a great, he was a great actor and a perfect, perfect choice for this. No one has ever been as good as Jonathan Kent as this. We have Phyllis Thaxter as Martha Kent. Martha Clark Kent. This was, by the way, the very first time anywhere in Superman that we discovered how Clark Kent got his name. His middle name of Jonathan was much later added. But when Jonathan Kent says, Martha Clark Kent, are you listening to what I'm saying? Oh, that's where he got it. No one in comics had ever done that before. Now we knew where Clark had got his name. It was picked up by the comics as well as then taking, okay, well, he must have a middle name, so let's put Jonathan in there for his father. Made sense. Uh, Phyllis Thaxter, her IMDb went 1944 to 1992 with 68 acting credits, again a worker. Largely uh, film until 1955, then a TV with multiple TV series, multiple regulars, multiple recurring roles. Got her a star on the Walk of Fame in 1960 for motion pictures. Her performance here is fine. She doesn't actually have a lot to do. She does more reacting. 
to things. But there is still a powerful line, you know, that one where she says to Clark, remember, son, always remember. Again, this is part of what goes on to define this character. He grows up in a place where you need to go do, do good deeds because of survival. He grows up in a place where his father passed away, and that's a huge moment for him, obviously. With all those powers, I still couldn't save him. And that is, you know, what motivates the end. And this notion that he has to remember where he's from, remember where he's from, because that is going to define what he is as Superman when he gets to be older. Uh, Larry Larry says, some kids take their mom's maiden name as their middle name. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, one of my kids, uh, her middle name comes from my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother would have liked it to have been her first name, but, you know, that's kind of what it was. A, it was a negotiation in terms of that. But she does have my grandmother's name as middle name. My, uh, my sister, uh, my mom's name and my sister's name, first and middle names are switched. One has one, the other one has the other. So, yeah. She also has a six degrees of Star Trek because she was in an episode of The Twilight Zone. And, of course, Shatner was in, William Shatner was in two episodes of The Twilight Zone, most famously Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. And, of course, Shatner played Kirk in Star Trek, the original series. Yeah, two hours. I'm going to go long. I knew I was. According to my notes, I'm only about halfway through. This is going to be a long one. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay. Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor. This is the only time he isn't wearing his, he's got a bald cap on. I'll talk about why in a minute. He's still with us. He was born in 1930. His IMDb presently goes 1959 to 2004 with 100 acting credits, so that's good for that time period. He did until TV, until about 1969, and then exclusively film with multiple TV series and multiple recurring roles in those TV series, and was a very well-regarded actor by the time he made Superman, like Marlon Brando, he came to this with an Oscar. He won the Oscar in 1972 for Best Leading Actor in a uh, leading role for The French Connection, which is a great film. I uh, suggest you watch it. It's really fun. And that's what he came to this film with, with an Oscar, just like Marlon Brando had come to it with two Oscars. He won another Oscar in 1993 for Best Actor in a Supporting Role for Unforgiven, another really good movie. It's a Western. I've seen it. It's very good. Won the Golden Globes one, two, three, four times. For first in 1972, Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama for The French Connection. 1993, Best Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role in a Motion Picture for Unforgiven. 2002, Best Performance by an Actor in a Motion Picture Comedy or Musical for The Royal Tannenbaums. 2003, the Cecil B. DeMille Award, which is basically a Life Achievement Award. 19, he won the BAFTA twice, 1973, Best Actor for two films, the, Fed, the French Connection and The Poseidon Adventure. And in 1993, won the BAFTA again for Best Actor in a Supporting Role for Unforgiven. Excuse me. Uh, AFI Award in 2002, Featured Actor of the Year Male uh, in Movies for The Royal Tannenbaums. And the Berlin International Film Festival Award in 1989, Best Actor for Mississippi Burning, another great film. Blockbuster Entertainment Awards in 1997, favorite supporting actor in a comedy for The Bird Cage, mentioned last week, I believe, or the night before, or something like that, when I was talking about La Cage aux Folles, yeah, it was the fly, well, The Bird Cage is the uh, English version of Cage aux Folles. Uh, the Cage aux Folles actually means the cage of crazies, so Bird Cage is what it turned into in the U.S. He won the Boston Society of Film Critics Award in 1992, Best Supporting Actor for The Unforgiven. Chicago uh, Film Critics Association Award in 2002 for Best Actor for The Royal Tenenbaums. The Cineforia Awards in 2015, he run an honorary career award. The Dallas-Fort Worth Film Critics Association Award in 1992, Best Actor for Unforgiven. The Golden Apple Award in 1996, he won Golden Apple for Male Star of the Year. The Kansas City Film Critics Circle Award in 1971, Best Actor for The French Connection. And again in 1992, Best Supporting Actor for Unforgiven. The Los Angeles Film Critics Association Award in 1992, Best Actor for Best Supporting Actor for Unforgiven. The National Board of Review, three times, 1972, Best Actor for All of These, Best Actor for French Connection, Best Actor for The Conversation, and in 1988, Best Actor for Mississippi Burning. 
He won the, the National Society of Film Critics Award in 1968, Best Act, Supporting Actor for Bonnie and Clyde. 1993, same thing for Best Supporting Actor for Unforgiven. And in 2002, same thing for The Royal Tenenbaums. Won the New York Film Critics Circle Awards twice, both for Best Actor, one for 1971 for The French Connection and the other one for The Unforgiven. He had the Online Film Television Association Award. He was inducted to the Hall of Fame in 2011. He won the St. Geordi, Saint Geordi Awards in 1975, Best Performance in Foreign Film for The Conversation. He won the Screen Actors Guild Award in 1997, Outstanding Performance by a Cast for uh, The Birdcage. He won the Western Heritage Award in 1976, The Bronze Wrangler for The Bite the Bullet. And in 1983, the same thing for Unforgiven. 1984, same thing for Geronimo, an American legend. <sighs> That's all of his awards. Just you wait till I get to John Williams. <laughs> you think that's a lot of awards. I had to do something totally different with John Williams. His performance, he is, again, another perfect pitch, perfect, um, you know, casting maneuver. You guys writing comics at DC or writing for the movies. Superman is a science fictional character. He works best when he is up against science fictional um, foes. And Lex Luthor always works best when he is a criminal mad scientist. Now, while here, he is definitely here for some level of humor. And, and you know, I think the thing is, though, as always, when you're playing somebody like that, you don't necessarily think of it as humorous yourself. You know, like when he says, and it's a question the audience asks, why is the most brilliantly diabolical leader of our time surrounding himself with total nincompoops? It's a funny line, but he delivers it straight because it's a question even the audience is asking. Why is he surrounding himself with these idiots? You know, And I think the reason is because a lot of people who he is playing a narcissist here, a severe narcissist, and he's playing it well. He's playing that totally straight. And there are moments when he's deadly serious and you see this psychopath emerging. It's surrounded by some comedy, but that's because I think he's got people around him who are stupid just so he can be smarter than they are. You know, he'd be probably be smarter than everybody else in the room anyway. But with the stupid people, he can really go down on them. He is... He is a narcissist who believes that he is better than everyone, and so when he's got these dumb people around him, he can say, I am so much better than you. The one line he's got with Otis. You know why the number 200 is so vitally descriptive to both you and me? It's your weight and my IQ. You know, <laughs> stuff like that, so that he can be an extraordinary narcissist. But again, there are moments when that absolute psychopath comes out. At the end, when he realizes that Miss Tessmacher has um, betrayed him, she, he is ready to murder her, and, and just totally seriously. So he, he was great in this role. He's playing a narcissist. He's playing a criminal genius who gets done when he wants done. And then there are the serious moments when he is deadly serious, and you know he could just kill somebody. You know, I, there's so many lines. You know, Superman says to him, is that, you know, the way you warped a brain like yours gets its kicked, kicks, planning the deaths of innocent people? He just outright says no, by causing deaths of innocent people, you know, as if what are you stupid? No, I, I, you know, it's it's perfect. He is a perfect guy for this. Now he did not wear the bald cap most of the time. What you're seeing here is a screen cap from the only time that he did wear his bald cap. They wanted to cast him, but he would not shave his head. So they did the next best thing. They kept making up his hair as different types of toupees. And we even see this in one scene where you can see all the toupees laying around. Just different types of toupees. He only takes it off when they got to drop him off in prison and he's about to tell the prison you know, warden and uh, Otis gets in his way, but he's about to tell the prison warden he's taking it off and saying, I'm Lex Luthor and these walls will never hold me. But he never gets to say it. That's the only time you see him bald. Um, the rest of the time, it's... It works. It actually works because the audience can tell, oh, he's just wearing rugs all the time. You know, um, It's his real hair, but they kept making it up in different ways that made it look like different toupees. So a great choice for this. Again, an Oscar winner by the time he'd come to it. Perfect choice. We have Jackie Cooper. Jackie Cooper as Perry White. 
Oh, my God. Another perfect casting choice. He went to uh, IMDb as 1929 to 1990. 131 acting credits, 42 directing credits with multiple TV series and multiple episodes, 10 producer credits. And his first role was in 1929 when he was at the age of eight. Now, Jackie Cooper was a child star. That was what he got his fame for. And he aged out. But largely because he was directing, he was still keeping his face in front of people. And so he was able to transition out of being a child actor into getting adult roles. Most child actors are not that um, lucky. Most of them age out and you never see them again. And I've talked about this last week, I think, with Hollywood. Those child actors are stuck in the limelight for a period of years where everybody around them is seeing how great they are. And they have not friends. They have hangers-on, people who are leeching off of their success to have some money of their own. And the moment that these people age out, they're all gone. Everybody just disappears. And that fracks with your head really bad. And it usually messes you up in some way. And if you're lucky, you get out of it with your sanity intact. In his case, he just said, okay, I'm not playing this anymore. I'll do directing. And by directing, he kept his face in front of people so that then he was doing adult roles. And he is, again, another one that is pitch perfect for this role. He won a primetime Emmy in 1974, Best Directing in a Comedy for an episode of MASH. He won it again, Primetime Annie, in 1979 for Best Direction in a Drama Series for the, an episode of The White Shadow and got his star on the Walk of Fame in 1960 for Motion Pictures. Again, perfect casting choice. He was exactly the kind of Perry White that every fan of that time was expecting. He was perfect, and he plays it beautifully. It's not quite over the top. He's a driven guy with occasional moments of humor that are kind of accidental. And when he does it, he knows. Like he says, you know, he says to Olsen, listen, give me a coffee with no sugar uh, and, don't, and don't call me sugar. When he actually means to say, don't call me chief. But if you look at his reaction after that, he's like, oh, God, I just said something stupid. Um, so really good. He's a good actor. Not really over the top, but perfect for this. Just perfect for this role. <laughs> Can't stress it enough. Everybody here is really, really well cast. Then we have Ned Beatty as Otis. Uh, Larry, Larry says, called the chief, like in the character on the TV show. Yes, except he kept, kept saying, don't call me chief. And, and people kept doing it anyway. <laughs> so, and that's part of it. It's one of the great lines. Uh, one of his great lines. Uh, he says to Lois, uh, you know, she'll clock around. I'm going to give him the city beat. And she comes back and says, hey, that's my beat. He says, look. Not only does he know how to cheat, treat his editor-in-chief with the proper respect and authority, not only does he have a snappy, punchy prose style, but he is, in my 40 years in this business, the fastest typist I've ever seen. But, you know, that whole bit where he knows how to treat his editor-in-chief with proper respect and authority, that's because he's not ever calling him chief. He calls him Mr. Wife. He calls him Mr. White, rather. So, But, yeah, he's, it's that. It's pretty cool. Then there's Otis, played by Ned Beatty. Had been around quite a, for a number of years before this. His IMDb goes 1972 to 2013. He is still with us. Uh, 166 acting credits, a worker with a mix of film and TV with multiple TV series with multiple recurring characters. By Superman, he already had, it was 1972 to 1978. By Superman, he already had 42 acting credits between 1972 and 1978. And he was a fairly well-known face at that time and still is. Um, he was known for both drama and comedy. He could do equally both. And he won the River Run International Film Festival Award in 26, 2006 for Master of Cinema. That's just a, a career achievement award. And he has six other nominations, including one Oscar. His performance. Okay. He's a very good choice for this, for a character that seems kind of out of place for Luthor. As I said, Luthor actually asks himself what the audience is saying. Why is the most brilliantly diabolical leader of our time surrounding himself with total nincompoops? And I believe Luther's unspoken answer is he is a narcissist and he keeps stupid people around so there's the opportunity to show them just how much smarter than he is. Now, Otis is pure comic relief. He is, he, but again, you know, Ned Beatty is such a good actor that even though he's stupid, or in this case, potentially mentally retarded, I think, 
it is extremely well done. It's a convincing, stupid person. Um, you know, he's comedy. He's total comedy relief, but he's a convincing, stupid person. Then we have Valerie Perrine as Eve Tesmacher, um, who is Luthor's paramour, apparently, in this. Uh, she's still with us. Her IMDb presently goes 1956 to 2016, with a huge gap between 1956 and 1971. But 1956 was a single credit for As the World Turns when she would have been 13. Uh, her real IMDb is 1971 to 2016. She was also a, show, a Vegas showgirl before becoming an actress. She has 68 acting credits, uh, has worked continuously, if not terrifyingly often, uh, as a mix of TV films, TV series, and TV movies. And again, prior to doing acting, she was, doing, was a Las Vegas showgirl. A uh, very beautiful woman at the time, obviously. Uh, Superman was her 12th credited role, and she had already gotten some acclaim. I'll talk about that in a second. Was a relatively unknown face, but probably hired because she was beautiful and she can act. And she is largely at this point remembered for this role. But she won a bunch of awards. She won the BAFTA in 1976 for most promising newcomer to a leading film role for the movie Lenny. Uh, Slaughterhouse Five, she's in, yeah, yeah. Um, Cannes Film Festival, 1975, Best Actress for Lenny. National Board of Review, 1974, Best, Actor, Best Supporting Actress for Lenny. And New York Film Critics Circle Award in 1974, Best Supporting Actress for Lenny. Again, a very perfect choice for this role. She is here to be Luthor's hot paramour. However, she is ultimately sort of playing the hooker with the heart of gold, as well as very convincingly playing the, a victim of a codependent and abusive relationship. And she can't act. When she's got the pair of lines, you know, when she, takes, when she kisses Superman and then takes off the kryptonite and he says, why did you kiss me first? She, it works perfectly. She says, I didn't think you'd let me later. And then, why can't I get it on with the good guys? It's all very sincere and it works perfectly. Again, sort of hook her with the heart of gold. And, and she's great. However, there's Superman 2. And Superman 2 always begged the question. The audience is always asking himself right from the beginning, why the hell is she there? Luthor looks ready to murder her when it fi he finds out that she's turned on him. And, it just, and, and, you know, there is, in fact, a deleted scene that I've seen. It was filmed, but not used. It was a couple of times. There's a, a scene established that Luthor keeps a whole bunch of alligators down somewhere that he calls his babies. And he tells, um, at one point, he tells uh, Otis to feed the babies. The end of the film, he's about to feed her to the babies. He's got her tied up and she's headed down. Superman crashes through the wall, saves her, and says, Miss Tessmacher, your mother sends her love. That would have been a scene right after the last one where Superman flies away from Lois, but it was cut for obvious reasons because it would have sucked. But, so why is she there in Superman 2? It doesn't make any sense. And in fact, the character herself asks the question that the entire audience is saying. She says, why am I here? What am I doing here? So the whole audience was asking that. I certainly did. There's no good answer. I think the only, the only good answer is she is in a codependent, abusive relationship and just can't help herself. Now, Mark McClure as Jimmy Olsen, another guy who is still with us. Uh, his IMDb is 1975 to present with one announced. He has 173 acting credits. I did not know he was working as often as he was. He's done largely TV. Superman was his 16th credited role. He also played Dax Ur in Smallville. And he is remembered for a number of things, both for this and as Dave, Marty's brother, in Back to the Future, his older brother, and has won no awards. Now, he's 21 years old when he was cast, but he's actually supposed to be playing about 16, and he's fine. He's really fine. There isn't that much to do. He is a bit of comic relief, except that it turns totally serious at the Hoover Dam, and right after that. And he would go on to play Jimmy. Uh, yeah, I was about to say that, Larry Larry. He would go on to play Jimmy in Superman 2, II, Superman 3, Superman 4, and Supergirl which is where he had the most to do as Jimmy. But, man, is that a crappy movie. I may review that next year. I may review that next year because I've got holes and it would ordinarily fall outside of my time frame. I have a weird 
fascination. I like that movie on a couple of levels. Probably because Helen Slater was close to my age and she's so fracking hot in that movie. Um, but I have good feelings about it, even though I know it's a terrible film. Uh, but yeah, he is in Supergirl. So most he actually does is Jimmy Olsen in any of this. He does in, in, in Superman 3. And, and when you see that fan edit, which I believe the name is Superman Redeemed, if you can find that, it's taking the best of Superman 3 and Superman 4 and taking out most of the stupid and turning it into a coherent film. And then he has some stuff to do that makes some sense. So, But he's fine. He does a fine performance here for what he's got. He isn't on the screen very long. Then we have another guy who... Perfect, perfect, perfect casting. Jeff East. His IMDb is 1973 to present with a very large gap, 1993 to 2010. Uh, 32 acting credits, largely TV. He worked very continuously uh, as a teenager. He was known for that when he was in this film. I knew him, and most people at the time knew him. He was in Tom Sawyer and Hulk Huckleberry Finn, playing Huckleberry Finn in both ones. He worked a lot for Disney until 1977, until age 21 when he could no longer play convincingly teenagers. Similar to many child Disney actors. Aged out. Fortunately, he was eventually able to move into more adult roles, and he's close to doing that here. And it was only a couple of years later when he really just aged out. He's won no awards, but he has another perfect casting choice. He resembles what you would think of as a young Christopher Reeve. And he looks so much like him that it's just perfect. The weird thing is that they dubbed his voice. All of his lines are dubbed by Christopher Reeve. Now, I, I sort of understand that choice. I sort of understand you want to keep the continuity with how he sounds. But I would be very interested to see what this would look like with Jeff East's voice, because I don't think it would be bad. Jeff East didn't have a bad voice or anything. Um, but again, he looked so much like Christopher Reeve that it's just almost uncanny. You could say, yeah, this is a younger, this is a younger Superman. And his performance is great. He's got that, you know, iconic moments with his father, his father's death, and that whole thing, all those powers, and it couldn't even save him. And that turns into a giant motivator for him at the end. So he does a great job here. We don't see a ton of him, but he does a great job. Then we have the category of everybody else. Now, under everybody else, we have Noelle Neal. Um, she played... And a scene that appears in the director's edition does not appear in the, um, uh, in, in the theatrical, and I really wish it didn't appear in the director's, but I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to give her a cameo. She played Lois Lane, uh, the first, person, first woman to play Lois Lane, very much younger, as you can see here. Um, so she gets a, a cameo here as, as uh, Lois Lane's mother. Then we have Kirk Allen, first guy to play Superman on screen. And he gets a cameo as Lois Lane's father. Then we have our Kryptonian villains. They don't do much here. It's really just to set up Superman 2. I'm not going to talk about them very much, except that Terrence Stamp has a single performance that he got stolen away for a Zod in Man of Steel. Only bigger. You know, I will, f no matter that it takes an eternity, I will find you, Jor-El. And it just turns into, I will find him. I will find him. And it's, oh, it's horrible. I just stole it out of him straight, only bigger. Um, but they're basically here to set up Superman 2, which they appear in very much. So I'm not going to talk about much here. They're not really worth critiquing because they're not there very much. Two of them just stand around. So there were a lot of other cameos in this. Rex Reed, who is still with us and is a... Uh, um, a uh, movie reviewer. I believe he worked for the New York, News, New York News at the time, which, by the way, was the building that they used for the Daily Planet building. It has that big globe inside of it, but it's the Daily News building. He has a very brief cameo. There were also reporters from the Daily News who had cameos. There were New York City uh, TV reporters who have cameos as themselves on TV. And there are really tons and tons of other people. If you go look for the IMDb, this is this this is one of the first films where everybody else turns into an army. You know, you can't go through them all because there's so many. Um, it, this whole period was when we started to say, okay, we're getting these big casts. And prior to this, they didn't necessarily credit everyone. Now they were starting to credit everyone, and that would go on to the present day 
where now we see whole armies from special effects teams, from special effects companies, down to people's, uh, you know, uh, uh, assistants and their secretaries that are all in the, you know, credited in the film. And that was starting here. That was starting here. The, the end titles were pretty long because of it. Finally, we get to the production. Uh, about two-thirds of the way through. <laughs> this is going to be a long one. I wouldn't be shocked. I would not be shocked if this was over three hours. I would not be shocked. This was, as I said at the beginning of the film, a very important film for me. And uh, you'll see more of how it impacted me as a human being in a moment. So the producers on this, there's three of them. First is Alexander Saukind. He's the guy in the middle, the older guy. He is uncredited exec producer, but he was. His IMDb was 1945 to 1992 with 21 producer credits, exclusively film except for 100 episodes of the TV series Superboy. I bet you maybe didn't know that there was a pre-Superman series that was pre-Smallville about Superboy, did you? I did, because I lived through it. I know, because I'm a fan die master. But this was back... This thing was on back when I was an actor. And I used to use, I used the opening and piece of the end title, se- title music for my voicemail. Now, I don't have a copy of it, but because I am the Fandai Master, I have recreated it for you. Here it is. Hello, you've reached the voicemail of William Stone III, actor, singer, adventurer. I'm sorry I can't come to the phone right now, but I'm out saving the entire universe from total annihilation. So my afternoon is kind of booked. But if you leave your name, number, and a description of peril, I'll answer your call in the order of urgency. Trust me. Yep. That was my voicemail um, when I was acting. Oddly enough, as I say, Superman has been with me since I was a tiny boy. I don't even remember when I wasn't a Superman fan. So I used that. Uh, the, uh, that probably got me a copyright strike right there. Um, the moment this is over, I probably have a copyright strike for using that uh, music. But that used to be my voicemail, and in point of fact, I know for a fact that it got me two jobs, uh, two summer stock jobs. And the weird one was on the first one, I actually had to live up to it. Oh, man. Um, I worked at uh, City of Clinton's Showboat Theater, which was not actually a, a riverboat, but one that would, a building that had been built to look like a riverboat. had a big paddle wheel in the back, about three stories tall. We took cast photos. I had to go up to the top of the line and stand there with my hands on my hips. <laughs> uh, it also did give me an extra line, and uh, we did uh, the musical um, Anything Goes. And I was playing a fairly minor role. Uh, but they said, hey, tack on to the end of that a bit of an adventurer. So that got me a couple of, a couple of jobs. And uh, as I say, that one summer I had to live up to it. The, the building was outside. Uh, there was a, a, a fairly well-traveled sort of main drag uh, that all the kids used to go on on Friday and Saturday nights. And we had to go across that to get where we needed to go. I was the guy that had to walk out in the middle of traffic and stop it. Had to live up to that whole adventurer thing. So, but what you saw there, um, that was on my business cards. William Stone the Third, actor, singer, adventurer. Uh, it wasn't the uh, you know you the bat blue background and the Superman shield, but that was on my business cards. So, that was back when I was an actor. So back onto Alexander Selkind here. Um, he is uh, has twenty three miscellaneous credits where he's billed as presenter on all of them. I assume that's sort of like. The producer? I don't know. I, and he's won no awards. Now, the uh, one of the other ones, the guy on the far left, is Ilya Salkind, his son. He is the credited executive producer. And his INDB is 1971 to 2015 with 24 producer credits, including 100 episodes of Superboy. And uh, one writer credit for three episodes of Superboy with no awards. Just going to walk through these guys and then talk about some of the production issues here. 
Third guy is Pierre Spengler. He is also a credited producer. 1971 to 2014 with his uh, IMDb with 42 producer credits. Most recently, um, 11 episodes of Metal Rant, which is uh, the French version of Heavy Metal, and it's Heavy Metal Chronicles. Metal Rant Chronicle. Superman is his uh, first producer credit. He has three production manager credits and two miscellaneous crew and has won no awards. Okay, uh, the production on this in terms of production aspects. This film was released on December 15th, 2000, I mean, sorry, December 15th, 1978, making today one, two, three, four, five days in advance. thought about doing it this week or next, and I said, no, nah, going to do it before. We are almost 40 years to the day when this movie came out. The budget on this was about $55 million, which is a fair amount back then. If you translate it into modern budget, that would be about $218 million. The profit on it was $300 million. And if you translated that into today's money, that's about $1.2 billion. Very, very successful film. Now, there's also the issue of Superman 2 because a large portion of Superman 2 was shot concurrent with this film. They were intended to be a two-part story. Superman would introduce the character, and then Superman 2 would pit him against these supervillains who could do anything. The same stuff he could. However, the producers got concerned about the amount of time and money that it was taking, and they ordered Richard Donner to just finish Superman. They suspend what he was doing with Superman 2, finish Superman, get that out, and then they do Superman 2. Well... Superman 2 was then completed by a different director. For some reason, they didn't bring Donner back for the rest of it. It was completed by a guy, uh, Richard Lester, who was an uncredited producer on the first film. And he discarded a bunch of Donner's footage and inserted a lot of campier scenes um, so that he could get an outright director credit on it. There were also legal issues at that point with Marlon Brando. He'd been contracted to be in both films, but when they changed the shooting, he then wanted a second paycheck for Superman 2. And so Lester shot a whole bunch of scenes with Lara instead of Jor-El because of that. Now, Superman 2 ended up being a lot more campy than Donner ever would have intended. And this read, led to outright camp the next movie, when Lester then directed Superman 3 all on his own. Now, in 2006, Superman 2, the Richard Donner cut, was released. It was edited by a man named Michael Thau, who incorporated all this footage that had been shot by uh, Donner, which was cut by Lester. Thau's edit reduced a lot of the campiness. It restored all of this footage that Donner had shot, eliminated many scenes shot by Lester, and it included the use of Jor-El rather than Lara. It has no Paris sequence at the beginning. That's all gone. Um, the sequence of Lois discovering Superman's uh, secret identity was totally different and more dramatic, but it was ultimately never shot for the film. So Tao was able to go and use a screen test of that scene. And while it's more satisfying dramatically, it is also quite obvious that it wasn't shot for this film. However, I think they were damned lucky that they had that shot, that scene at all. Otherwise, he would have had to have done something totally different and it would have sucked. <laughs> it's not shot for the film, but it still looks good. The Richard Donner cut, cut is therefore considered more serious, more dramatic, far less campy. However, the ending is less satisfying. What you have to understand is Superman 2, going back in time, was actually intended to be the end of Superman 2, when in beginning at the end of Superman 1. That was supposed to be the end of Superman 2. But when they said, hey, you got to do this film, and they thought about it, you know, you got to finish up Superman 1, and Mankiewicz and uh, Donner got together, and they said, well, let's put that one on. And it, that works great. That, that is a much better choice. Um, you, the Richard Donner cut uses going back in time again. Now, I'm sure that if Donner had gone on to make that film, they would have come up with some much more satisfying ending. Uh, seeing it a second time feels like a cheat, uh, but then so is Superman's mind-erasing kiss, Again, if they had made that film, Donner and Mankiewicz would have come up with something that made a lot more sense. If it were me, I would have done as they did in the film, robbed the Kryptonians of their powers, and simply allowed Lois to know who Superman is and let them start this relationship. Let them have the romance. 
That is what Superman and Lois are about, is a romance. Um, and just say, screw you, jor -El. I mean, jor would have been gone by then because of the, you know, he used whatever power was left in him to you know, put powers back into Superman. So jor has gone. Screw you, jor -El. You said I can't have any relationships. Well, screw that. I'm going to do it. Because Superman is, in essence, always has been, always will be a love story between Superman and Lois. And there's no dramatic reason not to build on it. And in fact, they did. In the 1990s, they finally took away the notion that you know Lois didn't know who Superman was and they just let them get married. Um, I think that would have been good for something to do for that. I think it would have been fine to just depower the Kryptonian villains and don't worry about Lois. Now, the director. Oh, my God, the director. Let me get back to my notes. Sorry. Hit a page down when I shouldn't have. Okay, director is Richard Donner. Still with us. Um, his IMDb is currently 1960 to 2006 with 60 director credits, largely TV until 1976, then film. He had just come off of The Omen, and he would go on to direct Lady Hawk, as well as Lethal Weapons, Numbers 1 through 4. He has 36 producer credits with one announced for The Goonies 2. Uh, I don't know, man. He has a mix of film and TV, including 93 episodes of Tales of the Crypt. And exec producer, he was the exec executive producer on X-Men and X-Men Origins Wolverine. Now, as I say, you want to impress me. Forget the Oscars. Forget the uh, Emmys. 1979, he won Best Presenta Dramatic Presentation for Superman, the Hugo Award. He also won the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films Award in 2000, the President's Award for a Lifetime Achievement. Excuse me. Sorry. He won the American Cinema Editors Award in 2009, the Golden Eagle for Filmmaker of the Year, the Casting Society of America Award, the Career Achievement Award in 2007, the Director's Film, the Director View Film Award in 2007, a Career Achievement, the Hollywood Film Awards in 2000, Outstanding Achievement in Direction, the Ojai Film Festival Award in 2008, a Lifetime Achievement, the Satellite in 2006, the Nikola Tesla Award, which I assume is also a lifetime achievement, and got his star on the Walk of Fame in 2008 for motion pictures. His direction. Oh, God, do I love his direction. It was brilliant. Starting with that opening that I talked about that was telling you right off the back we were A, doing something epic, and B, we're moving out of comics. We're moving out of black and white. We're moving to giant, big screen, serious stuff. And that first line. This is no, this is no fantasy. This is no careless product of wild imagination. And everything he did with the direction on that was just absolutely perfect. Um, it just all set the stage for telling the audience that this was going to be epic. Those huge credits and that, sw that sweeped in with that wonderful, amazing John Williams score. Maestro John Williams score. It was fantastic. Um, the slow move into Krypton. The first line. And then the various acts that he did. Again, it's four acts. Krypton. Smallville growing up. Metropolis saving the world. And as I say, they flow together. And I personally love, as I say, someone who spent time on a, uh, a, a working cattle ranch. I really respect the fact that he shot that right. And he's not making anybody look stupid. Compare it over to when uh, Superman 2, when R Lester did East Houston, Idaho. Just complete stereotypes all the way through. But not here, not with that act. The Kryptonian sequences, again, were nothing like anything put to film up to that point. And I'll have more about to say about that when I talk about the production design. But this was flawlessly directed. All that light, it was so light. And the crystals, you have no idea how difficult that is to shoot. Something that light is really hard to shoot, you're going to get. Reflections, and my God, those crystals, because they've got irregular sides on them, you're going to get, oh, oh. 
The direction on that must have been terrifying. And again, it was the, this was another one. It was the first time that Krypton's destruction was attributed to a supernova of Krypton's star, because that's what happens here. The choice to film, as Larry Larry said, in rural Canada for, uh, you know, apparently Smallville, I guess Kansas back then, uh, was an amazing choice. It was a great choice. He somehow found a location, as I said, that so closely paralleled in the, you know, in the, in the scene with the funeral, down in that valley, so closely paralleled, my, the valley of my family's ranch land. Again, this is one of those reasons that I feel a definite realness to these locations. And the choice to film in New York City for that was perfect. Again, totally perfect. In the comics, this is something not everybody realizes. In the comics, and you guys, DC and you know, Warners, listen to me. In the comics, Metropolis is New York City with all the bad parts taken out. Gotham City is New York City with all the good parts taken out. So by shooting that in New York City, it was generally bright, which it should be, without most of the horror of New York City, although there's a mugger. But doing that made it feel real. You know, you, you were not shooting on a soundstage someplace. You were in New York City and doing things in New York City. There were some sets, but you're in New York City and that's Metropolis. It works perfectly. It's perfect, 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 perfect. perfect. Cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth, to whom this uh, film is dedicated, he, uh, his IMDb is 1914 to 1970. I'm sorry, he, he was birth. He, he was born in 1914, died in 1978. The film's dedicated to him. And he died in Brittany on the set of the film Tess from a Heart Attack. His IMDb goes 1942 to 2001, despite dying in 1978. It's actually 1939 to 1980. He is credited for something called Superman screen tests, which were released in 2001, and uh, one used as a pivotal scene in Superman 2. Uh, as I said, they had that one scene where the way that Lois figures out Clark can't do Superman is she takes out a gun and shoots him. And that was a screen test, so they had to use that. He otherwise had 90 cinematographer credits, several posthumous because he was the post-production. Post-production takes a lot longer than you think. You know, you shoot a movie for six weeks, two months, whatever, and then post-production will take six months. So he's got some that are posthumous because he passed away because of that. Um, so he has six camera and electrical department credits, which usually means you're actually running a camera. He did almost exclusively film, and he was legendary in Hollywood by the time he shot Superman. In fact, George Lucas wanted him for Star Wars, but he was already committed to Superman. When he came to this, like so many others we've seen here, he'd won an Oscar. In 1973, he won Best Cinematography for Cabaret. And then again in 1981, posthumously, Best Cinematographer for Tess, the one he died in. He won the BAFTA, oh God, one, two, three, four, five, six times. I'm just going to list them off. He won the BAFTA 1965 for Beckett, 1969 for 2001, A Space Odyssey. He was best cinematographer for that one. 1973 for Cabaret and Alice's Adventure in Wonderland. 1975 for Murder, Murder on the Orient Express and Zardoz. 1978 for A Bridge Too Far, another great movie. 1982, posthumous for Tess. Won the British Society of Cinematographer Awards one, two, three times in 1964, 72, and 77 for Beckett, Cabaret, and A Bridge Too Far, uh, uh, respectively. Locarno International Film Festival Award 1958, Best Cinematography Color for Blanche Fury. Los Angeles Film Critics Association Award in 1980, posthumously for Best Cinematographer for Tess, and the New York Film Critics Circle Award in 1980, posthumous for Best Cinematographer for Tess. His cinematography here, now he is one of the few times, this is very few times, when I am aware of both the director's style and the cinematographer's style, enough to be able to distinguish their work. That does not happen a lot. In this particular case, I have spent enough time watching each of their movies that I know how they work. Donner has a certain style, and you can see it really in the car chases. You know, the car chase between the cops and the robbers where they end up on a boat with Superman. Reeks of Donner to me. There's a lot of places that reeked of Donner to me. 
But Un Unsworth has a certain look that is hard to put into words, but you can see it in the lighting. There are halos effects around a lot of different scenes here. Um, and that's really the only way I can describe it. But, you know, like the way he lights Lois and Superman when they're together, it also contributes, you know, not only do they have this great, great chemistry together, but they're directed a certain way. And I am dead certain in this case that with Donner and Unsworth, there was clearly a, a collaboration. This is what you always want in a film. You want collaboration between your cinematographer. Director says, I want to get this shot. Cinematographer says, okay, we can get that shot, but what if we change this? What if we lit this differently? What if we did that? And the director goes, good idea. Let's do that. And we can see that here that it's definitely going on. In fact, I even have a picture of the two of them working together on this film. There is a clear collaboration. Um, there were also technical aspects. You have to remember this was 1978. Everything you see here is real. When Superman flies, he's on wires. So when he takes off, he's on a crane. They would lift, they would put him on a crane and lift him up in the air 50 feet. That's what they would do when Superman would take off and Chris Reeve would jump and take off. He was on a crane and they would take him up 50 feet. It's all real. And sometimes it was in the middle of New York City in multiple locations. And Unsworth had to photograph this. He had to light it. He had to make it look good and not see the harness or the wires. And I just hand it more to Chris Reeve. My God, if you did that to me, you know, putting me on wires and say, OK, you got to sell flying and we're going to lift you up in the air for 50 feet, by the way. I mean, I guess I'd get over the heights, but boy, would that be tough for me. <laughs> and there was other flying when it came to shooting stuff like the flying sequence. Christopher Reeve spent so much time in harness on this when it came to flying. And he was, um, Christopher Reeve was in this harness on a sound stage in front of not a blue screen, but a green screen. I'm sorry, not a green screen, but a blue screen. And this is sort of problematic. In the original cut, the director's edition fish fixes the colorization. But sometimes his costume looks green because it, it is in front of a, a, a blue screen. So it, the blue in his costume was a little off. But Unsworth still had to photograph this. He had to light this. He had to make it look good and not have anybody see the wires or anything else that they are on. And the thing about it is that flying sequence is almost a ballet. It is almost a ballet, the way that it is put together and works. And I think Unsworth was a fracking genius for being able to get pull that off at all. Director can say, here's what I want. I want to, I want to see if we can do a ballet in the air. And we're going to have to do it like this because it's all real. And the, the cinematographer goes, OK, all right. I think I can do that. And he pulled it off. Um, his cinematography here is excellent. Every shot conveys some type of emotion, and I'm surprised that he did not get an Oscar for this. Oh, boy. Then we get to maestro John Williams, who is still with us. He born in 82, 32, 1932. He's 86 years old. He was recently hospitalized, but was released. His awards. I gave up. This is his printed Wikipedia page. Damn thing is 20 pages long. This is a list of all of the awards he was either nominated for or won. You go through and pick out the Oscars on this one page. This is just a full page of Oscars. One, two, three, four, five on one page. Next page. Next page. Next page. Next page. One, 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 one. Then there's this one, which shows his non um, uh, soundtrack related work because he did a lot of concertos that you may not have heard. And the man hit the top 40 three times. 
Actual Billboard Top 40, he had it three times. Once in 1975 for the main title from Jaws. He's the guy that did that. Dun, 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 dun. That's him. 1977, he hit number four with the Star Wars main title. Get this, because I remember it. Top 10 rock stations were playing that as part of the normal rotation. An orchestral piece running on NFM rock stations constantly. And then in 1978, he also hit number 13, which was also played on the uh, radio, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Music. It is Maestro John Williams. Now, I call him a maestro because with Star Wars, when he did Star Wars, he broke out of being somebody who just matched the music and into someone who was doing genius-level work. He was doing the exact same work that Mozart and Beethoven would have been doing in their time. The difference is he is paid by box office money, where they were paid by royalty. But he is doing the exact same thing. And when you get into Star Wars and a bunch of the stuff after that, you're dealing with music that are standalone pieces. You can take them out away from the action and just listen to them as standalone musical pieces, the exact same way that you can with Beethoven and Mozart. It is my firm belief that John Williams is the musical genius of our time. And he will go on to be taught at great universities, right alongside and in the same breath as Mozart and Beethoven. He is absolutely a maestro. And this is one of his maestro level scores. Not only does the music perfectly underscore every single action, it also makes it 10 times more exciting than it would be otherwise. And again, you can listen to any piece, any track of this at any time. It is a standalone piece, despite the fact that it is also underscoring the action. It's a standalone piece. And one thing that Richard Donner was blown away by when he saw it, much of the main title and some of the scenes with Superman actually have the word Superman in the, the music. Uh, it's, there's, um, there's, there's points at which Superman, the word, dun, 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 that's in there. Maestro John Williams' music here is perfect. It is yet another thing about this film that is absolutely pitch perfect from beginning to end. Maestro John Williams is perfect. He's brilliant here and brilliant throughout most of his career. Just look him up. I got 50 pages worth, 20, some sorry, 20 pages worth. And about 14 of those are awards. He is the musical genius of our time and will go on to be taught in the same breath with Mozart and Beethoven. He is a brilliant, brilliant man. Um, all right, production design by John Barry. John Barry uh, is no longer with us. He worked until his death, 1963 to 1980, with 10 production designer credits, A Clockwork Orange being among them, Star Wars being another one, Superman II is his last, but he also did some Bond movies. He had three art director credits, two art, um, art, three art department credits, two art director credits, and did exclusively film. In 1978, he won the Oscar for Best Art Direction for Set Direction for Star Wars. He won the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Film Award in 1979, Best Production Design for Superman. His design is incredible. As I've said before, he brought a version of Krypton that had never been seen to the screen by that point. Krypton in the comics was totally different. And this was a totally different alien uh, planet than we'd ever seen. This alien planet has never been seen before or since in uh, movies. This was totally original and amazing. Um, the entire notion of a crystal-based civilization is probably his. Um, the Fortress of Solitude and all of that that he built, that's his. Um, and everything that's more conventional, like the Daily Planet offices, look exactly like a busy newsroom would have at that time. It's now vanishing as print dies. Um, things like the interior of the Kent House, 
I can tell you haven't lived there. It's perfect. It's perfect. Um, he is doing an incredible job here. The crystal civilization alone. My God. Again, bringing something to Superman that had never been brought to Superman before and bringing something to the screen that had never been brought to the screen before. It's amazing. Now, special effects. Um, and this one I couldn't find anybody specifically to talk about. This is where we have another army of people who are working on the visual effects. Uh, it's like Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, also movies made during that period. This is where we started to see people who were just armies of people making it work. But what we can say about the special effects is they are awesome. Now, the miniature of the Hoover Dam burst and the town downstream of it does not hold up all that well. Um, you have to say that. It doesn't hold up all that well. Um, but you have to remember, no CGI back then. The best they had to do was models. And in the context of using models, I think, hang on a second, I've got to get my monitor back running here. In the context of using models, I think they hold up pretty well for time. If you were going to do it today, you'd make it CGI and it would look a lot better. But there's one scene in particular, one shot. I've shown a piece of it. It's that one with Clark Kent in it. One shot in particular that blows my fracking mind. Because I, for the longest time, I didn't know how they did it. And it's actually very simple. There is one shot uh, after the flying sequence when Superman flies away. He, fl he, he goes off of Lois's balcony, flies off into the distance. It's one shot. First is a two shot with him in the background and Lois in the foreground. He flies away. Camera tracks with her. And she goes into her room, into her apartment, because Clark's knocking at the door. Same shot. We're tracking along with her. And then she opens the door and Clark is there. For the longest time, I had no idea how they did that. <laughs> how do you get, because well, it was clearly Christopher Reeve. He leaves with that, he says goodbye with that huge Christopher Reeve smile that only he could have. Flies away and then he's back as Clark. How did they do that? Well, it's very simple. They put a rear screen projection. The rear screen projection is off the balcony and that Superman just flies away. And then real Christopher Reed walks in. I had no idea how they did that. And they do that a lot. They use rear, rear screen projection for things. They do blue screens. They do you know, uh, all kinds of different stuff that they did just to get this done. And then there's you know special effects involving practical things where Superman has to you know, lift, move pieces of you know, uh, rockets and stuff like that. All perfectly well done. And to me, I think they hold up quite well. Now, if you're looking at it from a 2018 eye and you haven't really looked at it, maybe you'll see matte lines that I'm overlooking because this is a favorite movie of mine. But I think in general, still, these special effects hold up well. And as I say, there's shots like that one that I just described. If you didn't know that's what they were doing, you didn't know. I didn't know for decades how they did that shot. Everything else in this film is just awesome in terms of special effects. Yvonne Blake was the costumer here. Uh, she was uh, 1940 to 2018, died just this last July. She, uh, her IMDb is pretty long. I'm not going to go over it. Her Oscar, she won an Oscar in 1972, Best Costume Design for Nicholas and Alexandra. Well, that was 1972, so yet another person who's coming to this production with a freaking Oscar. Won the Gijon International Film Festival Award in 2015, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Won the Goya Awards one, two, three, four times, all for Best Costumer for different uh, um, shows. Her costumes here are fracking amazing. Okay, let me show you Superman's costume, okay? Superman is an invulnerable alien, okay? He doesn't need armor. He wears spandex. In making the costume the way they did, it was perfect. By the way, also, Superman has red trunks. It looks completely wrong when you guys in comics and TV and film are doing it. It looks totally wrong without it. Superman has red trunks. And maybe a throwback, I know it is, a throwback to the circus strongmen of the 1930s, but it still looks wrong without the trunks. 
So if Superman writers, artists, and filmmakers, listen up. Superman's costume has trunks. Deal. Superman also wears bright colors. He is not Batman. He is a lighthearted adventure character with a great romance. He works in the sunlight. He is the embodiment of the best of humanity. So his colors are bright and he doesn't hide his face. Modern Superman writers, artists, and filmmakers, Superman's costume has bright colors. Deal. Now what Yvonne Blake did here was essentially adapt what was in the comics of that era almost identically. And that is part of why it works. There were multiple versions, by the way, of this cape. It depended on what the needs were for shooting. He had certain types of cape for just walking around. He had something heavier for that didn't billow in flying sequences, etc., etc. She made a lot of different capes. And this was the first time that that kind of attention had been paid to Superman's costume, having different capes even. Then there are the Kryptonians, which are really kind of amazing. Um, she did something really astonishing. Again, bringing things to the screen that had never, ever been brought to screen before. If you look at this one side here, these costumes, this is Jor-El's costume. It's, that's how it looks under normal lighting. It's weird and beige. But the other side, when you put the lighting on it, wow. And she did that with everybody on Krypton. It was perfect, really, really perfect. Um, you know, I, knew that, I didn't know that until I, just a few number of years ago. This thing turns into that thing with lighting. Wow. And by the way, the S shield on the front, this was the first movie that established that that was the L family crest. Uh, everybody else, all the other Kryptonians have different ones. It's their family crest. It did not mean hope. That wasn't something that came up until Man of Steel. But the fact that it was the family crest was something that was later picked up in comics. Uh, it, it, uh, she does an amazing job. What can I say? Um, she, when she does rural Kansas, and the film is taking place in 1978, his rocket crashed in 1948, meaning he grows up in the 1950s and early 1960s. He left the farm at about 1966. You should follow his timeline. Uh, spent 12 years in the fortress with Jor-El. Um, so the costuming in uh, the Kansas area is totally perfect. It's what would have been worn by people of that period, teenagers of that period. It is perfect. And not surprisingly, she was old enough that she probably lived through some of that. When you get into Metropolis, that current era of 1978, well, the costuming is what you're seeing is what people wore. It isn't what we wear now, but it was what people might be wearing. It looks dated today, but it did not 40 years ago. Everyone, including Otis are generally wearing things that fit the era and generally consistent with the kind of costume that their character would have worn, the sort of clothes. Otis as that dumb hat. Well, he's like dumb or outright mentally retarded. I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, but as with all great costumers, the clothes tell you something about the people wearing them. You know, Lois on her date. She is wearing an upscale flowing kind of dress that also works perfectly in the flying sequence. It makes her look, and this was intentional, that costume in the flying sequence makes her look like an angel. When she's flying next to Superman, you know, he's got his arm out and she's flying next to him, she looks like an angel. That's intentional. That is brilliant costuming. That is saying we can make somebody look like an angel. Hey, Jay, how's it going? Catching what could be a damn four-hour review. <laughs> this is a big one for me, and I've gone into extraordinary detail on it. I'm nearing the end. <laughs> so she was a brilliant customer, had an Oscar to her name at this point, and again, you get into things like that thing that Lois is wearing. When you get into that flying sequence, it is intentional because she looks like an angel. Just amazing. Great costuming. And those Kryptonian ones, man, got to hand it to her. Just amazing. Makeup here. Again, as we're seeing in Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and just about everything that came afterwards, makeup is an army. It's, uh, you know, it's really hard to even, um, you know, specify any single individual as who did what, unfortunately. 
Jay says, that an interesting dichotomy. I recall that Lois in Superman 78 was a very human character, smoking and splashed orange juice everywhere. Um, she was grounding uh, where Superman was uh, a plastic character. I don't agree about Superman being a plastic character. But what I think, and I did talk about it, Lois has an edge to her. And the edge melts off when Superman is there. Um, it's part of the chemistry that they have together. So, uh, But again, our, our makeup here is done by an army. I don't know who to credit. Um, the makeup here was great all the way around. Um, I, I think they made the spit curl on Superman work, myself, and that stuff to do. Everybody else had makeup that uh, was appropriate for who they were and what they did. So, The reception on this one. Well, among fans, believe it or not, the movie caused controversy in fandom of that era because at that time, Clark Kent had moved on from being a print reporter to being a news anchor uh, for station WGBS, which was owned by the planet's parent company, Galaxy Broadcasting. And Superboy was in existence at that time, as he had been since the 1940s. Superman, in comics at that time, had made his first appearance as a teenager. That did not happen here. He was an anchor for a news, uh, or a news TV show. That was not done here. They, did, they made the correct choice. They went back to more Superman's roots. It's kind of silly to have Superboy running around. And Clark Kent, as a news anchor, among other things, just dramatically increases the notion that somebody's going to notice it's Superman under those glasses, you know. If you're broadcasting to 4 to 8 million people every day, you know, um, but he went back to his roots. Donner went back to the roots, and he made the direct, uh, the choice, uh, the appropriate choice for this movie. However, fans were up in arms about it for a while. Uh, let's see. Jay says he's too perfect, but Lois's imperfections are where, why he finds her attractive. That's one of the things. Yeah, absolutely. Killed me, John Williams. Score wiped uh, out, wiped me out worse than Goldsmith's uh, Trek score, and I bet that couldn't have been done. A Donner was a hell of a storyteller. Yes, yes. Uh, I've gone through all that and uh, I mentioned too. I I didn't even do anything for Williams because this is Williams' twenty-page um, uh, uh, Wikipedia. This is his awards. This is his hit records and other things he did that were not associated with. You go do it. <laughs> He was a maestro. He was a maestro by then because he'd become, in my eyes, maestro with Star Wars and continued on that for a long, long time. In terms of the critics on this, Rotten Tomatoes currently has for critics at 94%. I think that's about right. And they described Superman as deftly blending humor and gravitas, taking advantage of the perfectly cast Christopher Reeve to craft a loving, nostalgic tribute to an American pop icon. I think that's a little simplistic. As I said, going through this, Superman is who he is because of his backstory. And it is a backstory that most people do not understand because they've lived their lives in nothing but urban areas. When you have grown up in a very rural area like Superman did and like I spent my time in, I see why Superman does good deeds. I see why Superman is not out to take over the world. I see why he looks kind of perfect, and I know why he fights for truth, justice, and the American way as thought of as a limited government that does very little except keep its people. So I, I, think, he's I think he's like that. But uh, Donner was a hell of a story. He had done the Musketeers thing. I don't remember. He may have done Three Musketeers. There's so much stuff in his IMDb, it's hard to call it all out. <laughs> Anyway, in general, um, people now consider this somewhat of a quaint film, but it's not. It's really not. The problem is that people have been so conditioned to expect nothing from horror from life because that's all that Hollywood ever presents. And they can't accept that a character like Superman could exist. And yes, he can. Yes, he can. A character like Superman can exist. I know why he is the way he is. I have seen it. I know I've got his background down pat. DC Warners, call me right now. 
However, uh, Jay says, I like how in 1970s New York, sorry, Metropolis, he sticks to his guns, he's going to be Superman, and you're not talking him out of it. Yeah. Yeah. He does a... Chris Reeve was perfect. He was just plain perfect. And he plays his character, and I, don't, I think he got it. I think he got why Superman was the way he was. Modern ones don't. Going to talk a little bit about Hollywood, California. Hollywood, California. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. It is an industry in which horrible people do horrible things to other horrible people on a daily basis. No one can count on a handshake. Successful people don't have friends. They have hangers on and yes men all currying favor to exploit the, the success of someone else. And rape and child molestation rule the day. If that is the only life that you know, it's the only life that you can write. The problem is that's only Hollywood. The rest of the world is a much brighter place. Certainly you can find horrors, but not every day. Most people's lives in the Western world are very, very good. We have friends. We do good things to good people on a daily basis. And we don't generally curry favor, at least not as a full-time job. You can count on a handshake. And rape and child molestation is considered a true horror and not a fact of everyday life. There really are no casting couches outside of Hollywood. And you should never take anything that Hollywood produces seriously. It is created by horrible people doing horrible things to other horrible people on a daily basis. This is their life. It is not yours. And you should never mistake it as anything else. Going back to Jay here, Brandon Routh and Henry Cavill did all right, but they didn't have Donner helping them. If they'd had the right directors, they could have done it. Uh, I think maybe, uh, yeah, but uh, I'm afraid, Jim, I'm not going to go over it again because I went over it a lot in the beginning of the film, I mean, beginning of the review, and I don't want to go back and retread it. Uh, suggest watching the beginning from over three hours ago now uh, because I talk about quite a lot about, uh, you know, how they had the right everything for this film. So, uh, things that had impact on the comics, as I said, there uh, is, has always been some impact in film that bleeds over into the comics. The comics, um, for example, Superman, as I mentioned at the beginning, did not fly until the Fleischer brothers said, hey, Superman looks kind of stupid, leaping around in our car cartoons, can we make him fly? DC said, sure, and then DC just took over and did flying. Same thing with Jimmy Olsen. His character first appeared very nascently, in uh, a Fleischer cartoon, but DC thought the idea was good, so they fleshed it out in uh, uh, the comics. Uh, Jay says, oh, yeah, yeah, Superman 78 is a masterpiece, yeah. I uh, said at the beginning, it is now floating next around to Star Wars, because I've watched it so much for this review, as to whether or not it's my favorite movie or not. The film introduced the Kryptonian uh, crystal-based civilization. In comics, Kryptonian civilization was a lot more conventional. However, that whole crystal thing was so good that DC eventually incorporated it, particularly the Fortress of Solitude. Now, the fortress had been in existence since the 1940s. First, Superman had built a retreat for himself in some mountain range not far from the metropolis. And it wasn't called a fortress, it was just a retreat. But in the 1950s, he then carved a fortress out of the ice at the North Pole. He put it there so that nobody would ever find it and he'd have, you know, something to go to. Uh, much more Flash Gordon. I'm not sure what you're meaning there about that. Much more Flash Gordon. Uh, oh, you mean the, the comic, uh, how they did Krypton. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, they were influenced heavily by the way that Superman had originally been done. They didn't think they should mess with it very much. And that came out of the 1930s. And so this was just radically different and they took it. Now, in terms of the fortress, he built it, as I say, carved it out of the ice and the, and the Arctic. And as time, the fortress went on to be quite a number of things. He had a zoo for interplanetary animals. He had a storage locker area for dangerous weapons that shouldn't be allowed to get out, alien lessons. He had a place to house his Superman robots, 
which Superman used in the comics when Superman and Clark needed to be in the same place at the same time or Superman was busy. He had a storage for Kandor, a Kryptonian city that had been miniaturized, miniaturized by the supervillain Brainiac that Superman was constantly searching for a way to make bigger. And it was a jump off for various story points. It was a jump off for Nightwing. In the Silver Age, Superman and Jimmy Olsen went down to Kandor, got miniaturized and went to Kandor. And Superman had no powers there because it still operates under a simulated red sun. So they became superheroes known as Nightwing and Flamebird. That's where Nightwing comes from. In the Silver Age, when Robin grew up and grew out of Robin, he took Nightwing as an homage to Superman, who was Nightwing in Kandor. That's where Nightwing comes from. Knowing that is part of what will make you a Fandai master. Uh, Jay says, I really enjoyed the 1990s animated Superman. So did I. Yeah, it was from the same people who made Batman the animated series. Yeah, I liked everything through that, all the way through uh, Justice League and everything. Yeah. Yeah, Jay, he was the, sort of the Candor Batman, but again, it was Superman playing him. But again, that's where Nightwing comes from. That's where Nightwing actually originates, is from the Bottle City of Candor, when uh, Superman and Jimmy Olsen went down to be superheroes. The Fortress of Solitude was also a museum. It included Kryptonian artifacts, displays of uh, Jor-El and Lara, the Legion of Superheroes, with whom uh, Superboy was uh, involved with very heavily, and also statues of his various friends, including Clark Kent. Because the notion was if he brought visitors, he wanted Clark Kent to be around the statues of all of his other friends, because at that time Clark Kent was just supposed to be a sort of a friend of his. He wanted to throw people off. So if he brought you know visitors, oh, there's Clark Kent, okay, whatever. Uh, how did Jimmy Olsen learn Kryptonese? Yeah, I don't remember. It was, it was some technical geo-repokery. I don't, I don't remember how they did it. However, because this Kryptonian crystal civilization was so amazing, it was ultimately picked up in the comics, and 99% of what the comic fortress had been just disappeared. Uh, it was dropped, and they went to this crystal thing that had been built by one of the crystals. So, it is <laughs> three hours, 17 minutes, and we can finally get to the end of the review and ask ourselves, is it any good? Uh, Jay says it was a challenge for the artist to get it right. Yeah, in comics it is. In comics it absolutely is. But it became so iconic because of this movie. Um, they just felt they had to take it. And it was a good choice. I think it's a good choice. That is an extraordinary piece of architecture that they came up with. We have never seen it since. Only in Superman. We have never seen anything quite that creative on any other level. So it's amazing. So, end of the review. We could ask ourselves, is it any good? Oh, frack, yes. I said at the beginning, this, yeah, how did Bill really feel about it? Yeah, well, I did three hours, three and a half hours. This is the best Superman movie ever made. Probably will be the best Superman movie that's ever made. And it's one of the best superhero movies, if not the best superhero movie ever made. It is at heart, and this is the most important piece of it, it is at heart a love story, one that I love. I will tell you, the flying sequence has been a source of my dreams. I dream about that. I dream about flying the way Superman does. I dream about going on a date like that. I dream about taking a woman. I have dreamed about it, literally been asleep dreaming about it, taking a girlfriend out and flying the way that they did. That's how big this movie is to me. Yep, flying dreams. Um, it's a romance. It's a wonderful romance of two people who fell in love at first sight, even though it was a different first sight. One was Clark when he saw Lois in Perry's office, and the other one is Clark Lois when she gets saved by Superman. And it is a wonderful love story. And the two of them together have so much chemistry, it's awesome. But it also has lots of action, lots of character development, and it carries a full 2.5-hour movie. And again, it was a film in which a 
enormous number of creative and experienced people were both behind the camera and in front of it, and it came together to make a brilliant film. If it's not one of your favorite films, if you're a science fiction, fantasy, superhero, or a romance fan, if this is not one of your famous favorite films, then you have been conditioned by a lifetime of crappy movies made by horrible people who do horrible things to other horrible people on a daily basis to be dead inside. Uh, you still kick, oh, kick up with the soundtrack. My God, I don't remember how many times I've watched this in the last two months. Uh, again, go back to the beginning and I talk about how I tried to simulate how I saw it in a theater once. I don't know how many times. I, I, and kicking up the soundtrack, yeah. Um, I have uh, uh, on my phone, I've got a... Uh, a, 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 a playlist called Bill's Party Mix. Opening titles of Superman are on there. The um, Kent family theme part is on there. You know, when he's in the area. Because when I go out to my, my family's ranch, and I said earlier in this thing, where they shot that in Canada is so similar to my family's ranch land that when I go out there, I play that music because it makes me feel exactly right. And I've got the opening titles, and I have the uh, ending and denouement of when Superman is saving Lois. Just amazing music that I put on there. Big Air Forms, big volume. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, soundtrack for Superman 2 was slightly different, but actually added a couple of nice touches. Yes, it did. Uh, I don't like the orchestration for it. It isn't as good. But the, the, the soundtrack isn't bad. I don't, I don't mind it. I, I, I do like the opening titles on that one. Uh, although I've seen now the Richard Donner version. You know, the Richard Donner edition that was put out, I, I like better. But. And the soundtrack from Superman Returns is pretty cool, too. Yes, yes, it is. John Ottman made uh, extraordinarily good use of the John Williams themes. He also put in some choir stuff where it was appropriate. And I really liked the choir parts. So, as always, for the next uh, month, until, well, next couple of weeks until we actually hit it, I am pushing my uh, five-hour charity live stream for New Year's Day. Uh, Donner did three and four Musketeers as a back-to-back -back production. Oh, didn't know that. Didn't know that. He was trying to do that with Superman 1 and 2 here, but the producers wouldn't let him, unfortunately. Yeah, well, you know, the producers uh, on this one didn't like him French either. That's why they kicked him off for the second one. Bad choice. Anyway, I am now pushing. Uh, until New Year's Day, I'm pushing a, um, a New Year's Day five-hour charity live stream. Because I learned a few weeks ago, a couple of three weeks ago, that one of my regular viewers... As a brother who was in the campfire as a survivor from Paradise, California. Sorry, this way. This is Paradise, California today. So on New Year's Day, I'm going to run a five-hour charity live stream to raise money for campfire survivors. I'm not sure which uh, charity yet. If you are Super Crew 63 watching this in the archives or at any time, please contact me at wrs at wrstone.com because I want to talk to you about specific charities that would help your brother. In any case, I will be doing it for a charity. I'll also be doing non-spoiler reviews of the Orville, uh, which starts up as also uh, the Doctor Who New Year's Day special. And I've got at least one pretty cool uh, interview lined up, another one that I'm, another two that I'm tracking down pretty hard, trying to bang on them really hard. So we'll see how those goes, and hopefully we'll have some interesting interviews. Uh, I think this is why, uh, yeah, Donner Superman got wiped out. Uh, when does the Orville start up? Uh, I believe... It's, uh, I don't remember. It's like the 28th or something. I've forgotten. I know it's, you know, close enough within a couple of days of, of New Year's. I remember that. So non-spoiler reviews on those. Don't want to spoil it for anybody. So there'll be non-spoilers. So I said this before. Going to say it again. Because it's true. Science fiction fans have always been an extended family for each other. And as the Van Dye master, I have witnessed this for decades. I always mention you can go to Robert Heinlein when he went to conventions. And Heinlein had a bad condition that he needed blood for when he was a young man. And so he would get hundreds, thousands of people at science fiction conventions to donate blood. I've also seen it personally. I have seen it in terms of you know somebody 
who knows somebody who knows somebody and you get far enough down the chain and you may be able to discover things about some what's happened to somebody that you haven't seen in a while or maybe you want to know about maybe they've gotten in danger and you can find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody we have this you know if ever i want to know something about somebody i am lucky enough that B. Joe Trimble associates my name maybe in a positive way, I'm not sure. But I can I can go to her and say, hey, B. Joe, um, do you know somebody? And she knows everybody. This is who we are, and this is who we've always been. Fanish history teaches us that this is how we've always been. We disagree always about our favorite film and TV show. Everybody goes on about how Star Wars, uh, The Last Jedi, is splitting fandom. Hey, uh, guess what? Ain't the first time. Um... Space 1999 immediately comes to mind. Lots of fights between fans over that. And even Star Trek, the original series. As good as it was, literary science fiction fans didn't think it was that good. There was splits there. However, when the need arises, the chips are down. We have never failed to help our fellow fans in need. This is what we, who we are, and it's who we've been for more than a century. And that is something we can be very damn proud of. So I have this viewer whose relative needs help, and um, he's lost everything. So that's why on New Year's Day, I'm going to do a five-hour charity live stream devoted to raising money for him. So please join me. Please tell other fans about me. You know, try to get more people in here maybe than I usually do. And um, as I say, I can tell, say now that I do have at least one interview. Um, I won't say who, but I'll give you a hint. Space Command. And my time is different. I'm going to give people a chance to get over their hangovers from the night before, maybe watch a little football, and I want to have the th whole thing over by before midnight Eastern time. So the time for this will be 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Mountain, 3 p.m. Pacific, and if you're working off of UTC for the first time, it will be 11 p.m. that same day. Um, remember, remember this. Remember this and be very damned proud. Because we are fans. One of our one, whenever one of our own is down, we will always help them up. It is who we are and who we've been for a hundred years. And this sets us apart from everyone else among the stars. So, in closing... I will again do t attempt to do ad copy in uh, the uh, immortal style of Ernie Anderson, one of those voiceover guys. <clears throat> Next Monday on Tales from SYL Ranch, Professor Quatermass is back when an excavation of a London subway turns up mysterious skeletons that are almost, but not quite, human. All are clustered around what seems to be a spacecraft buried five million years ago. Now, Professor Quatermass must work to stop all hell from breaking loose. That's next Monday on the Fandai Master's 60th anniversary review of Quatermass and the Pit. And, of course, Tales from SYL Ranch it will be live here on Mondays. I'm not doing Sunday anymore because, well, no more Doctor Who. I will, however, next month be starting in on a Thursday or a Friday. I want to do a Thursday review. The problem is the Orville will come on at what my usual 8 p.m. time slot is, I think. I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure I'm going to do with that. I'd like to do a review immediately afterwards. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll just switch the time on that day. If not, it'll be Friday, but I don't really want to do Friday because people do things on Friday. So... Um, anyway, the schedule until Orville comes back uh, next month is um, um, in North America, Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Mountain, 6 p.m. Pacific. And if you're working off UTC, that'll be 2 a.m. the following morning. Yeah, I'm thinking about kicking it back, like Jay says. I'm thinking about kicking it back to Friday. Problem is, people go out on Friday. I try to keep that dark. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see how it works out. I, we'll see how it works out. Now, in terms of upcoming reviews, there is a schedule on my website, www.wrstone.com. If you click the schedule and you click on any given um, uh, review that's in that schedule, you may find a place on the Internet where you can watch that thing for free. 
I tried to do that a lot. As always, of course, being in IT for 40 years, man and boy, I can tell you, always use effective ad blockers inside of your web browser. And I explicitly suggest that you use uh, uBlock Origin. That's U, the letter U, B L O C K. And you can find that in your uh, web browser's add on repository. Do that, do that, do that. After Quatermass and the Pit, I will on December 26th be coming in uh, after Christmas on Boxing Day to do Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Then on New Year's Day, of course, I'm going to have my five-hour live stream charity. And again, the time is different. That'll be at 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Mountain, 3 p.m. Pacific, and 11 p.m. UTC. Then on January 4th, uh, starting Friday nights, I will be doing mini reviews of that week's The Orville, if I can do, I can't do Thursdays. January 7th, I'll be doing the 70th anniversary of The Son of Frankenstein. January 14th, the 100th anniversary review of The Mistress of the World. And on January 21st, the 66th anniversary review of King Kong. Still have that weird song as in your room? Which one? Uh, the Tag of the Killer Tomatoes? Yeah. <laughs> Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Okay. All right. All right. I'll give it back to you there. So, in terms of support, uh, please like this video. Please subscribe. Tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and, and livestock to do the same. I will let you know I am... Sorry. I have 327 people listening to my police fire. Something is going on here. You never get 320 some people. Uh, my thing is off except for alarms. I'm going to have to listen to that. It never happens you get that many. Um, anyway, uh, I am now off Patreon. This is because Patreon has begun banning multiple individuals due to totally SJW reasons, and I cannot support that platform anymore. I am off of it. The account has been terminated. I am now on a, on a newer service that does not seem to be doing this, at least not yet, and a bunch of YouTubers are moving over there for the same reason. It is called Subscribestar, and I have a link for it to below if you want to go over and do anything. However, I would ask you in this instance to save your money. Don't give me any contributions this time. Wait for the five-hour live stream and do some contributions then because clearly, clearly, other people need this money more than I do. I have a house. So, yep, subscribe star, Jay says. That's where I'm headed. That's where I headed. Closed out my account today. I'm not going to do this anymore. They have become toxic. I'm not going to do it. So, that said, I guess that that is probably all the time that we have today, boys and girls. So tune in again next Monday for my review of uh, Quatermass and the Pit. Until then, this is Tales from SYL Ranch, the vlogcast that reminds you to always know where your towel is. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.